Sebring, a course that doesn't need any introduction, but I'll give it one anyway. Situated just about 70 or so miles south of Orlando and 140 miles northwest of Miami sits a disused Army airfield. Well, back in 1950, Alec Ullman was in the area scouting for a place and he found an absolute Jim Hendricks airfield. Well, he wasn't going to be repairing aircraft at the field. No, no, no. He had found a premier sports car racing mecca. Several renovations later and skip ahead to 1959, it had already begun its 12 hour glory and wow, it's been a long time, but we're still racing here at Sebring. Hello everybody and welcome to this RCI special event. It is the two hour and 40 minute Sebring race here on iRacing. I'm Jesse Lee joined by John Dalton today with Ash Bibby bringing you every lap from the action today. John, welcome to Central Florida. Yeah, thank you for the warm welcome there, Jesse. It's, uh, it's a new one for me here on the iRacing uh, circuit, shall we say. Uh, never ever played iRacing, very small time back in many years ago. Uh, but here we are today with the two hours, 40 minutes, of course, as you said, at Sebring, one of the oldest continuously uh, operating racetracks in the United States with the uh, first race being ran in 1950. And of course, occupying a portion of the Sebring Regional Airport, still considered an active airport, albeit for private and commercial traffic but originally built as a hendrix army airfield which played host for a training base for the uh, united states air force uh, Marianne andretti a three-time 12-hour winner was once quoted as saying that one of the hardest parts about the original track was finding the track to begin with uh, there have been many accounts of drivers retiring due to accidents at night quite simply because they got lost on the runway sections and couldn't find the track again. Hopefully some drivers today not being uh, under that one. And uh, of course, most importantly, the track was poorly marked down with white lines and cones, a very stark difference to uh, what we see here today, Jesse, of course, an FIA grade two circuit, I believe plenty of uh, white markings, curbing and uh, lots of uh, floodlights around the circuit, making it much, much easier than it probably was back in the 50s and 60s certainly is back in the day it was 5.2 miles if memory serves and a little bit longer a little bit more twisty than it is today though it's hard to remember or even uh, believe that this track used to have more twists and turns very hard to find your way around almost no markings today we uh, have all of those uh, sort of modern amenities one thing though this track has not lost is its bumpiness it's concrete it's an airfield after all and it was meant for airplanes not high performance race cars it used to test the cars as much as it tested the drivers i suspect we'll see a lot of that here today as well a lot of drivers being tested of course we bring you this event immediately following a historic week for iRacing the rain update has happened and for a lot of these drivers outside of the the public uh, daily races that they would have been doing this is likely the first trial by fire that they're going to have to deal with and john i've heard it all week long these gtps are tricky to handle yeah we were just discussing in the uh, the pre-show there that of course the GTPs with the modern hybrid system, you know, the high amounts of power they do generate are an absolute handful in the wet. And uh, during practice, we did have a wet circuit. We saw a few GTPs turning themselves around a little bit too much curb usage in some parts and drivers just maybe being a bit too eager on the throttle and the LMP2 cars, uh, the Delara P217, certainly uh, much, much easier to uh, contend with in, in the mixed and full wet conditions. And of course, the uh, very familiar with the GTDs, uh, very easy to drive, of course, in, in kind of any scenario almost set up these days for the uh, gentleman racer with the modern TC and uh, ABS systems that they do, yeah, of course, in ploy. Uh, qualifying, I believe, Jesse, if I'm right in saying, has finished. We do have a, a, a timing tower on the left-hand side of your screen uh, displaying the fastest laps. Uh, Cinderlar taking pole for the GTP class. Campregna taking the LMP2 class. 
and dollars out of course polling it in the gtd uh, but all times looking very very close indeed jesse even in the uh, gtp uh, category very small margins between them lmp2 exactly the same as well and of course the gtd one of the closest classes i mean you know, all the way down to P6, separated by uh, just um, just under a second. Uh, so it's going to be very close indeed as we get underway here today. Those all actually went ahead and broke out of that bracket, so they will have a target on their back here, being a couple of tenths ahead. But look how just close it was to Shuranak and Sindelar in the GTP category, about half of a tenth. And if they can keep that up all race long, of course, it is a long race, two and a point four hours. They're going to have to get a move on and shake a leg. There is still still some puddles out there on the racetrack. As I look out the window, I can definitely see some damp parts of the racetrack. Some of the cars, indeed, also, even in the bright Florida sunshine, still kicking up a little bit of water as well. But that has not deterred any of these drivers. It is pretty uniform across the grid in all three categories. They're all on dry tires, at least of the cars that have already selected it. I think that's absolutely the right choice. We, as John said, had the weather come in and practice. It persisted a little bit into qualifying, but now the track getting in a, a more green state, a more ran in state as well with the rubber. And everybody now confident here to put back on the dry tire. You can tell folks at home with the tire indicator on the most extreme right-hand side of the timing and scoring. Uh, don't mind the white dot in the middle. If the edges, though, the little uh, sort of almost like parentheses marks, uh, if they're white, that is a dry tire. If they ever turn blue, they are on a wet tire. Now, I bring that up because we have had it occur already drivers putting on the wrong tires the wrong tires being equipped automatically in pit lane john because every time you come down pit lane every time it resets uh, i racing will automatically equip tires for whatever session it is so if this goes wet and they forget to change their tires or vice versa if they're on wets and it goes dry again and it re-equips or rechecks that you're going to change tires we can have a similar issue one like the we've seen in AMS2 and ACC here on broadcast on RCI TV where they're on the wrong tire. And of course, you don't want that. That's an extra stop. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, you know, it's very easy, isn't it? From speaking from experience, at least in ACC, uh, to select the wrong tire. Of course, you're checking all the other parameters in the pit stop are OK. And, you know, a lot of iRacing drivers not used to having the uh, the different compounds of tire, though the dry and the wet so again it's not something that's going to be playing into their almost routine as they come down pit lane of course we are on a staggered start as such is in the uh, the real life imsa series of course they uh, start in their categories their groups should we say of course with gtps at the head lmp2s just down the road then gtds further back so hopefully by the time we all filter into turn one turn two all of the uh, the arguments are settled and hopefully everything is kind of calmed down because of course what you don't want to be is a gtd at the back of the field, Jesse, completely blindsided into what could be a very potential dangerous situation should something go wrong at the head of the field. No, you're absolutely right. All these categories, they're going to launch by themselves. You can see them on the top right-hand corner of your screen. That's the track map. Yellow indicates GTP. Blue is the LMP2 class, and pink is the GTD class. Of course, we use IMSA names and IMSA monikers because that's what this series is based off of. In GTP, you have... Acura's, Porsches, and Cadillacs and BMWs, all Dallara's in the LMP2 class. That almost mimics real life, of course. And you've got the mix of the typical GT3 fare. And before we ever get even started here today, a quick explanation. What's the difference between a GT3 and a GTD? Some aero changes and for some cars, a difference in fuel tank. And uh, that uh, may be just about it. There's some electronic differences, too, I think, with the the safety system as well for uh, you know for, for for yellow flags and stuff like that but beyond that basically the same car the whole premise between gt3 and, and gtd is uh, the theory is you could be racing in europe in a gt3 champ take a week to convert it get it over to america race it as a gtd car convert it over a week again and go back to gt3 racing absolutely spoiled in that class and as john alluded to earlier keep in mind we get weather or even not in weather 
And keep in mind, that GTD class is the only one that has any sort of uh, ABS traction control. That should absolutely help. Sindelar, Suranak on the front row. Hufford, Smith, and Holland in row number two. Daly and Raffier in the next row. And a couple of more. You got Erkma, Boss, and Miller filling out the GTPs as we get ready to go. Two hours and 40 minutes of racing. We hope that it starts up quite cleanly. And there they are before they even get clear of the final corner. We are green here at Sebring. And it's an easy start for Sindelar. Sindelar, who has been running through the GTP field in the weekly iRacing series, has continued that here today. Yeah, Sindelar, fantastic launch out of turn 17 of Sunset Bend. Positioned the car perfectly on the outside. Got excellent drive off. And before they even got to the line, was already clear of P2. The LMP2 is, of course, underway as well, just in the background. Looks like they've all got through the first turn relatively safely, of course, until the uh, the second turn uh, that is the, uh, the, you know, the pinch point, essentially, when everybody has to stand on the brakes and get checked up. There's a GTD round in turn one. Uh, so the GTDs have not got off to the best start but again relatively speaking jesse only one casualty so far makes this a very clean start indeed a couple of the lmp2s are fighting for position but this is where it happens this is vast on they're just going to get taken out here was that tom bryan i suspect it might have been in the 244 got into the back of the vast on ferrari and they have continued on but that was significant damage there I do believe, John, and you may be able to correct me here, everybody has a fast repair here today. You hate using it on lap one, turn one, but if you do have the fast repair, it is uh, the most beneficial thing. Uh, fast repair, of course, for the uninitiated is just basically it's a mulligan. You come down pit lane, and instead of having to wait a few minutes for repairs, it does it almost instantaneously. It's a few seconds and you're back out there, uh, sort of Spider-Man rules. Everybody gets one. Look at this, LMP2 category. Everybody getting sideways. Dijkstra has found themselves the innocent bystander, turned the victim no good deed, let off the throttle to keep from running into the back of what I believe was Ted Edwards and Ingman. It ends up paying the price himself. Yeah, very unfortunate there for the uh, PCDC motorsport car, but managing to get it back under control, kept it out of the wall, which was the crucial thing, as we uh, we said earlier. And oh no, Van Stone is around once again in the Ferrari, and I think he's used to tow back to the pit lane. He has indeed, Jesse, so Ferrari mechanics are going to be uh, getting very frantic over that car, trying to repair it and, of course, get it back out underway. Just three minutes or so gone, and everybody looking relatively calm. We've got another race replay, I believe, coming up here. Uh, this is coming into Sunset Bend, turn 17. Oh. Just buckets of understeer there for Miller. Uh, just not what you want to see in the Cadillac and he has come down pit lane as well so probably some uh, front end damage on that GTP car yeah that's exactly what it was I, if I had to guess just hit the bumps wrong and when you do that in, a, in any car here but it's even more pronounced in these high horsepower GTPs you're sort of locking up but because of the bumpiness of that final turn you're skipping off of it like a stone on a lake and you can't do anything. You don't really see the lockup because, again, the tires aren't touching the ground most of the time, and you're just along for the ride at that point. How many times during the 12-hour and uh, the uh, other races here have we seen stuff like that occur? It looks innocuous, but you're, you're literally you're skipping like a stone on a lake there. Miller into the pit lane. He's done the repairs, used the fast repair, no doubt, and is back out there on the racetrack. The most important thing for Miller is may have used the fast repair but didn't actually have to tow they were able to drive that car that that incident happened in the final turn they were e they were able to very easily get that car back on pit lane uh, without having to tow vaston who is ninth of course in the gtd category and saw their issues i think that second incident they had of course was just a product of uh, some of the aero knocked off that car potentially a tow link as well they elected to not continue to drive that car around, probably erring on the side of safety and caution. They did tow, and you can tell the difference. Uh, Milner, Miller is on an outlap for the GTP class, and just now has Vastone got off the hook back in the pit lane to the attention of his team. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? I mean, if you know Vastone could have got through and uh, managed to nurse the car back around, then again, the time loss is 
you know, significantly less than electing to uh, take the tow back to the pit box and of course taking the, uh, the full repair there. Just riding on board currently uh, with Les Stevenson, a uh, RCI staff member and a, uh, and a driver that we're very familiar with here, uh, Jesse, from the ACC side of things with us here at RCI and doing a fantastic job in the uh, Porsche. Not usually uh, seeing Les in a Porsche uh, within the ACC realm, so uh, very interesting indeed to see him in the 992 for today's race. He's currently chasing down uh, Zanton just ahead. Half a second or so uh, separates these two guys. You can see Zanton is ever so slightly quicker last time by with a 203.6. Uh, Les with a 203.8. And of course, uh, Roskam just behind another driver we see a lot in the ACC realm, 203.8 as well. So Les is going to have to be careful when he does catch the back of Zanton not to put himself in a position that allows Roskam to then close that gap behind because then Les is going to find himself in the middle of a three-way fight. Sure is, and that wouldn't be an unfamiliar spot for Les Stevenson to be in the middle of a three-way. And right now, he's just worried about not running into the back of Zanton as he gets as close as he possibly can do through that particular section up into 10 and 11. And uh, you, you got to be careful early on in a race like this. You don't want to damage your own car. You've got it going well so far. You're in the middle of this pack and you're just kind of gauging, probing a little bit. The about Roskin, by the way, has caught uh, Les Stevenson because he's been somewhat cautious, has Les to this point. Zanton has realized too that he's not going to be overly aggressive as Les. So he's just running his own race. These three have lost contact. Piotr Dominicus, Pilvain, Bullwinkle, and Dolzal in front of them. And uh, looked like, oh, I thought Gordon for LMP2 went off the course, but just maybe ducked a single wheel off there. You can still see, John, can't you? A little bit of spray kicking up around some of these corners and some of these straights even as well. Yeah, there's still a, a little bit of standing water uh, on the side of the circuit. Uh, again, keen eyes will have noticed that. So not a fully dry track here at Sebring. Got to be careful, of course, not to hit the standing water and the wet patches on these dry tires because, again, you're going to lose crucial temperature out of the tire itself. And then, of course, you're going to you know, lose essential grip uh, out of the car, which is definitely what you need here. See a little bit of spray there on the back straight being kicked up by your race leader, Sindelar and Cyrenac just behind, again, point five or six seconds to the good in the uh, Porsche 963 GTP. Again, two very different lines we're seeing through Sunset Bend there. Cyrenac takes a much tighter line than Cinderlar does, but of course Cinderlar to the top of the board, 145.591. Uh, Cyrenac just managing a 145.6. So again, over the lap, it's a very minute difference, Jesse, but a minute difference over two hours and 40 minutes. Might see Cinderlar take overall victory here today. Zindelar knows how this goes. They usually have found themselves being fought with early in these IMSO battles. Of course, today, a completely different task, a longer race and a different racetrack than they will be very aware of. But Zindelar knows how to win. They know how to get this done. They've done it multiple times, and it's exactly like this. Just they're not trying to really pull away from Surinac and maybe Surinac's a little bit quicker. I wouldn't say Sindelar has ever been the outright fastest GTP. They haven't had to be. They're the most consistent. They made the fewest mistakes and they have absolutely reaped the rewards of it. This is textbook thus far from uh, Sindelar. But as I say that, if Surinac gets by the 191 Acura in that uh, number 17 Porsche, we're talking about a completely different race. And oh, by the way, we're gonna be catching traffic soon. Yeah, first of the traffic there, we've just seen the uh, the BMW staying on the racing line, of course, remaining predictable. That could be uh, Tom Bryan uh, in the number 244 machine, just in the back of the shot there. The leaders dispatching very quickly of the GTD, and it is indeed uh, Tom Bryan in the HWT car. Again, saw him in an incident in Turn 1, not such a good start for him. Uh, meanwhile, towards the uh, front of the GTDs, we've got Pilbeam on the back of Dominicus here, getting very close to the concrete wall in Turn one and it's 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 a corner of bravery turn one you've really got to pin the car through there tuck it as close as you can to the concrete wall without of course making contact with it and it's uh, it's very easy to have a lapse of judgment especially when you're following another car jesse you kind of zone yourself in to the rear end you almost become mesmerized and kind of hypnotized by what you're doing and sometimes you end up failing yourself into the wall through no fault of uh, anybody else's but your own but of course uh, pilbing here looking very competitive just behind the lamborghini 
Yeah, it's one of those things. You get lulled in that false sense of security. You're just sort of watching. And, oh, you know what's not watching here? Now, that's a horrible incident that we've seen there. Gordon gets spun completely around. I didn't quite catch the, the number of the truck that hit him, but that was uh, unceremoniously deposed was Gordon there. And that will uh, draw some questions, certainly, from the driver of the 623. Two different lines. We you talked about that briefly earlier on in the GTP category, but two different lines right there. But just looks like he got ran into the back of and completely spun around and uh, that'll frustrate you early in a race like this yeah i think that was uh dijkstra in the number 12 the pcdc uh, motorsports car again he had a, a rotten start so he knows how it feels to be down the uh, the bottom end of the field so going to claw back and maybe just getting caught out by drivers of course very different skill sets should we say in the race today again you have to be wary of the, uh, the talent gap in the field in these kind of endurance races don't you jesse not everybody is as competent as the uh, the race leader should we say not everybody is visually aware maybe some people don't even have spotters with them today of course being a minor two hour 40 minute race it's very small in comparison to what we're used to in the modern day ted edwards uh, race replay here that's coming down in to turn seven the uh, hairpin at the kind of west side of the circuit uh, looping it round on the brakes i think just got a little bit too keen on the brake pedal jesse again i believe no abs in the lmp2 cars the rear's locking up and ted just going around back was very unfortunate there but got it back under control got going again and a very minor time loss still in p7 overall just behind there you see the 12 of dykstra Ooh. meanwhile we've got gtps mixing in with the gtds this is les stevenson in his fight of course with xanton and ross cam but he's had the uh the leaders go through um the, i think that's the triple r car just gone through there and another Porsche GTP to find their way through the uh, the GTDs. It's, it's very tricky, isn't it, Jesse? At a circuit such as Sebring, uh, you mentioned earlier, of course, the uh, the bumps. Again, we've got the, the wet patches still on the circuit, so you don't want to find yourself offline and you know, out of the ideal grip line, should we say, where you know you end up turning yourself or losing a bucket at the time and, and maybe even losing positions in the case that is, of course, right now with Les Stevenson. He's got Ross Camp just behind him in the Ferrari. Again, one you know, one GTP up the inside could be all Ross Camp needs to get past Les up into P6. That was Miller, by the way. I believe that was off of the racetrack there. The number nine Cadillac has been involved in something here. Now, keep in mind, they're one lap off the, the pace, and, oh, they just lock That's it up, leader. turn in, and... Oh, they just, it wasn't that's the Sindelar. leader. Was that Sindelar they had contact with in the Acura? Yeah, that's Sindelar just coming up behind there. And, of course, Miller losing it on the brakes. It's still quite wet uh, down into, I believe that's turn uh, turn 10, uh, just after the hairpin, of course, the uh, the north side of the circuit, should we say. Um, just locking up on the, uh, the entry there. There's still a lot of standing water going into turn 10. Uh, we saw it earlier on riding on board with Surinac following Sindelar. There's a lot of spray coming up down there so maybe miller just kind of panicked a little bit on the brakes jesse locked the rears turned himself around and very unfortunate indeed Sindelar was just in front and you can see already maybe some damage on the front end of that acura but it's, it's allowed surinac to close up right behind Sindelar. this gap is very close indeed as surinac looks to the inside into the hairpin of turn seven just not close enough on Sindelar decides to kind of think twice about it but you can see there jesse the understeer from Sindelar through the hairpin he's way off the line there's going to be a little bit of moisture out there and surinac to the lead in the porsche 963 and uh Sindelar surely has to be thinking about that fast repair right now jesse Sindelar had a little bit of damage you can absolutely tell the car under steering under uh, well any sort of speed corner was unable to keep Cernak from getting underneath him Cernak I think did the great thing they just let the Acura run wide they took the Porsche down the inside every opportunity they got uh, Sindelar did a really great job even with the contact kept their head kept the lead for just about a lap after that occurred but even still, just uh, with the damage, no match for Cernak, who had already ran down the leader in the Acura. New leader, Cernak has taken it. Yeah, Cernak to the lead now. We've got some race replays coming at you. This is uh, Han through, I believe this is turn uh, 
five, possibly, uh, before the big bend of turn six. Uh, a little bit of a wiggle there, finds himself off into the grass and the gravel. A uh, bit of time lost there. We've then got uh, Kevin Boss, uh, meanwhile, coming up the inside. Oh, that's, man. that's in the GTD class in the BMW Hybrid again. Expertly split, should we say? Oh, oh no. very close on the rejoin there. And another car off in succession with Kevin Boss. I'm not sure if that was an LMP2. I think it was. It that was, was Hyla. Oh, Indeed, no. here's the replay now. Just clip the rear of Hyla as he tried to go through past Kevin Boss on the outside there. And, of course, that's going to be a big time loss for Hyla. And I think he's even towed back to the garage, Jesse. Uh, if the overlay is right, uh, I believe Hyla is now in the pit lane. But Kevin Boss still soldiering on, currently in P8. And another mistake there going down into the hairpin. Uh, not sure if this is a replay or live pitch. I think this is still a replay. And uh, this is the last one, I believe, queued up at the moment. This is Hyler again trying to get back to the pit lane. You can see oh. the, the steering or a tow yep. link's broken there, Jesse. And takes yep. a sensible thing, pulls off the driver's left and elects to take that tow. Meanwhile, Miller also in the pit lane just ahead there in the number nine blue Cadillac. That's probably going to be from the uh, contact earlier with uh, Cindelar. Meanwhile, in the GTD, Dominicus coming up behind Bullwinkle. BMW on Lamborghini here. Uh, this is essentially for uh, P2 of the GTD category. And, of course, Dominicus in the pink uh, Iron Lynx. Lamborghini just behind. And, again, more traffic coming up, which is going to complicate things coming up into Turn 10. Uh, looks like turn 10 has slightly dried up a little bit, but still the wiper on from Dominicus. You still see a little bit of spray off the back of the BMW M4 of Bullwinkle. So still very much wet towards the uh, north side of the circuit, but certainly dry around the uh, the pit straight area now, Jesse. Yeah, you can see some of the windscreen wipers of the cars turning on part, to, part of the way through the lap. That's just because they're getting a little spray and they don't want to be distracted by it, so they'll flick it on for a second, turn it back off as soon as they uh, feel they they can but uh, they don't want to get distracted they want the full picture and while they don't really need to do that of course all the the, the windscreens are are treated i think it just it's a comfort thing for the drivers some drivers i've driven with drivers who just don't care i'm one of those uh, the spray never bothered me but uh, other drivers they want a pristine windscreen and uh, it's certainly in races where in series where you have like uh, the uh the, the, the little tear-offs and everything too. There's drivers that uh, always request you to take one of those off, but unfortunately, you don't have that luxury in real racing where you have one for every pit stop in an endurance race. So somebody eventually has to double stint the dirty windscreen. So uh, a bit uh, a bit humorous, but also just another creature comfort thing. Happy to have that uh, are the drivers. And a uh, little scary moment here, mobile chicane as the number seven car makes their way through and just about gets it done. That's Felix Devenza Hacker, who gets through there, but just about gets through Big Ben before they almost throw it off of the road. Well held and saved by Tesvenza Hacker, who uh, got through the mobile chicane quite nicely and, uh, of course, preserved this battle between Bullwinkle and Dominica's BMW versus Lamborghini. Everybody minding their uh, P's and Q's here for the most part. No crazy moves necessarily. We have seen more than a couple of cases. We saw it with Ted Edwards first, didn't we, John? But I was going to say about that, uh, Ted Edwards might have been the first to lock the brakes up and spin in the LMP2 class. I can guarantee he wouldn't be the last, and I can still guarantee we haven't seen the last of that. That's a common issue here. You get behind on your braking. You think, ah, maybe I can do it a meter later. You can't. You have to be proactive with your braking in the P2 class. You get it wrong. A lot of times your brake bias is not going to do anything for you except send you around. Yeah, it's, isn't it? It's not going to be the first time. Like I said, it won't be the last. I'm sure we're still going to see drivers uh, making mistakes towards the latter half of the race, of course. Uh, so it's been a hacker that expertly, should I say, uh, managed to snake his way through the uh, mobile chicane. And we've got another one here on oh. the back straightaway. Three wide coming down into Sunset Ben Ted Edwards and Fabian Schmidberger battling with each other again. Nearly on pace car on the right-hand side. Ted Edwards on the left. It's two very what different lines through it? Sunset. I know. What year is this? It's been 
been years since I've seen Schmidtberger on a circuit, but Ted Edwards nearly into the wall through turn 17 of Sunset. He comes out just alive, and meanwhile, we've got the uh, the battle ahead as well for GTD. We've got Dominicus on the inside of Bullwinkle, two LMP2s coming up behind through turn one indeed. Onto the wet stuff, onto the grass goes Ted Edwards, three wide into turn three, and Ted Edwards just about manages the dispatch of the GTDs, but meanwhile, Schmidtberger is going to be held up essentially by this fight you know you can't find a way around a schmidberger big sideways moment in the background very well held on to in the lmp2 class but just look at the gap jesse traffic giveth and traffic taketh away schmidberger the big loser in that fight certainly was still side by side here for this battle dominicus and bullwinkle bullwinkle's gonna win that fight there had the inside for turn number seven, that's the hairpin. Meanwhile, while that was going on, there was a humongous accident coming through Sunset Bin, one LMP2 and several GTDs involved. The, the about Roscom and Les Stevenson. This is Hain, and Hain starts this. Oh, and he comes back in front of the track, and there's Les Stevenson, and there's several of the other cars as well. It looked like, it looked like a Chevrolet involved but i don't is there any chevrolets in this race i could have sworn i saw a c8 corvette and here's the aftermath of that that is the about roscom he got the biggest part of that with les stevenson the entire front clip of the triple seven ferrari is gone he's trying to drive it back to the pit lane to avoid towing the car meanwhile tesvinzo hacker has just had a massive accident of his own as we continue to watch joe dauber uh, here spin the car around there actually no that was a uh, he's actually pitting to his teammate here i believe putting him in the car and this is what happened to to Vinza hacker they got too far to the end of turn 17 and strangely that close to the pit lane they decide to tow back to the lane there uh, it's all kicking off here yeah absolutely so and uh hayne here back out of the pit lane and around in turn seven cold tires no Again, tire cold. blankets indeed like you say jesse cold tires no tire blankets uh, maybe locking the rear up ever so slightly under braking and uh, jumping on the power maybe a little bit too eagerly as well uh, but yeah absolute chaos just uh, just ensued there of course with Hayne commencing it all and collecting uh, Stevenson Zanton and uh, of course Ross Cam that has since been towed to the pit lane and uh, you know handed over I believe to Joe Dorber if the uh, time and tower is correct the triple seven at the bottom of the uh, GTD category uh, Les Stevenson has been in and out for repairs he caught the brunt of the uh, the Hain incident, of course, across his front end. So the battle with Zanton has been momentarily diffused. Tom Bright now the next nearest car to that fight. As we see, uh, this is uh, Raffia and uh, I believe uh, Erkma just ahead there uh, through turn one. They go, of course, they've been uh, line of stern for a few laps, Jesse. We caught them earlier, cutting between all of the traffic and uh, they are still as they were. The uh, Triple R car, of course, just ahead there. Both Porsche 963s oh, over the curb. It's a bad exit for the uh, the Triple Three of Ermka, and uh, Raffia finds their way through. So position change in GTP, uh, but, of course, still a very big gap ahead to Jordan Daly in the number 14. Jordan Daly has uh, pretty much the biggest gap of the cars that haven't had any sort of calamity thus far in the GTP category. Sindelar is four seconds behind Cernak for the lead of the race. Credit to Sindelar. They haven't brought that Acura in prematurely. Of course, the fuel tank in the GTPs, a little bit less than the LMP2s, which then again is also a little bit less than the GTDs. We expect the GTDs to go the longest, of course, than the, the, uh, the LMP2s. And of course, the GTPs will be the first on and off of pit lane. They may even have to take an extra stop. I haven't done the math fully, as you might not expect, but uh, it's going to be close with two hours, 40 minutes. They may need to take a splash and dash. Everybody else might be able to just about manage it on a couple of uh, two or three stops here. We'll see. Play it by ear. It depends on how things certainly shake out in the pace of course. This battle still going on. The majority of the prototypes have made their way through. And this battle certainly persists. Bullwinkle and Dominicus, 4P2 in their class. I got to say, as well as everybody else raced around them, they raced each other quite well. They sort of, they were momentarily diffused, weren't they, John, when other traffic like this Porsche was coming through the field. 
But after that, matter of fact, these are the leaders in GTP coming through again. But uh, they they didn't they didn't get too greedy, and that's what has preserved this battle for P2. Yeah, it's all about choosing your fights, isn't it, Jesse, in these uh, longer races, as we see. Uh, Miller round again in turn 10. I think he's been caught out once again on the brakes in that number nine Cadillac. He's not having a great afternoon. Here's a race replay provided to us onto the brakes in turn 10. He goes, and very much like earlier, Jesse locks the rears off to driver's left this time rather than driver's right and uh, hasn't collected anyone else to my knowledge, uh, but is currently stuck on, I believe this is the inside of turn 11 successor to of course turn 10 the uh, the left hand switchback so of course not gone all too well for him there um but yeah back to the point of course it's all about uh you know choosing your fights there's certain times when you don't want to be on the attack especially if again you have faster cars coming up on you it's just gonna make that a whole lot more messy than what it could be if you left you know a car's width uh, for a GTP to slot into, much like, uh, you know, Dominicus did with uh, Surinac when he came through. Uh, there was a gap there. The Porsche passed him, slotted him between himself and Bullwinkle, and then the fight obviously can continue a few corners later. Les Stevenson in the background there, still lapping around, although just slightly off the pace, as this is the uh, fight essentially for P4 uh, overall. Of course, the PCDC car of uh, Dijkstra, the number 12 there, just behind Zhong, so I think this is a, a Dutch on Dutch battle uh, here at Sebring, currently in the LMP2 category. And Jesse, I'm not sure if it's my eyes, but the skies at Sebring here certainly look a lot darker than when they did when we commenced this event some 45 minutes ago. You know, I was just thinking that, uh, man, this weather is looking very Florida to me a uh, very dark off into one direction and ominous to say the least bright sunshine currently over the racetrack at the moment but uh, we know that can change here in an instant now in i racing and that's something that may depending on the timing of this that might catch the gtps out i think everybody else if that storm does blow in over the track i think everybody else will be fine the gtps though they might run out of time everybody's going to be trying to maximize here but uh, I don't know if the fuel tank will allow the top class to continue. Huge run around the outside there. Looking for a particular or a, maybe a move there. Uh, wasn't able to get it done and uh, still lying the stern. I'm not even sure uh, that, that purple car uh, was, uh, is that uh, it's a 212? Is it 213? It's 213, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it's the 213 of Hyla who is a lap down. They clearly, they've got better tires. They're trying to make some of that gap back up. Fabian Schmidberger, though, who we are running on the uh, right rear fender well of, has no particular interest in Hyla's flight to this point. They're trying to make up uh, some of these spots for the time being. It's a race of attrition, endurance racing, especially around Sebring. That's what it was originally envisioned as, just like the 24 of Le Mans, it was envisioned as a race to test manufacturers, to test the craftsmanship, the building structures of cars, and also a driver's might and fortitude. And it, it, it's crazy. It's 2024, and the cars are way more reliable, and the drivers are clearly faster and more honed in than they've ever been. But the adage is still correct, isn't it, John? This is a track that will test the craftsmanship of your manufacturer, of your machine. It will test your fortitude as a driver. And if you take your eye off the ball for a moment around this joint, that's when you get in trouble. Yeah, absolutely so, Jesse. You know, it's like you say, it's still very bumpy in, you know, comparison to a lot of modern day circuits, you know, essentially still an airfield for the uh, majority of the start finish straight turn one. And of course, the uh, the last turn of turn 17, very, very tricky to uh, navigate yourself through there consistently across again, like, you know, in the real life event, 12 hours of driving. It's not only a test of, again, like you say, machine, it's also a test of the drivers, of course, fitness levels compared to the 50s and 60s to today's level of fitness that you, you have to have 
for a uh, racing drive. You know, it's very easy for us to sit here at home and, and you know play on our virtual rigs. As much realism as we do get in these rigs and the simulators these days, it's still not comparison to being in a real car. Again, with all the g-force, the load, the temperature, the noise, you know, the physical focus you have to have navigating through traffic and uh, other cars around you and battling for positions overall. It's a it's a very tricky thing in real life and in the sim as well these days. You know, simulators have become so advanced to what myself and yourself probably started out on some 15, 20 years ago between us. It was very basic stuff back then. Force feedback was not a standard thing on a lot of wheelbases. It was, you know, very much the sidewinders of the time that started the uh, force feedback trend and continued, of course, to the uh, Logitech. And now we're on direct drive units, as we see here. Uh, this is Hahn again through uh, turn seven. A little bit more of a drift this time. Locked up coming in, jumped on the power, drifted out to the outside of the uh, grass and managed to keep it going. So uh, maximum style points for uh, Hahn there, but maybe not the fastest way to navigate through Sebring. But again, a lot of the... Uh, oh, as we see, Schmidberger locked up on the rears that's in front of Hyler. Hyler managed to get up the inside uh, this is into turn seven again we see a lot of drivers with big problems down into turn seven especially the LMP2s I feel are a bit more prone down there but again the uh, the, the I was going back to my point of obviously wheel decks are a lot more advanced nowadays you can almost simulate high loads through them and uh, really give yourself a workout on the uh, simulator at home and uh, speaking of uh, you know races of attrition uh, there's a word from Miller some keen-eyed viewers in the uh, GTP category will have noticed the uh, DNF next to his name. Uh, the wheel has snapped off his wheel base, he's uh, commented in the RCI Discord Sebring Racing Chat, which may be why we saw him with his last incident into Turn 10, of course, finding himself in the wall and then parked on the inside of 11. Uh, so not only, Jesse, is it a test of machinery, uh, you know, drivers, it's also a test of hardware, apparently, at the moment. Well, I think, too, in a lot of cases, you can substitute for virtual racing the reliability of a, of a, of a chassis to the reliability of one's personal sim rig, one's personal hardware, and uh, that's a, a horrible thing. I don't think I've, I've heard a lot of stuff in my day uh, never snapping completely off, if that is indeed what has occurred. That is absolutely remarkable and not in a good way inside wall contact you bet it is for Tazvinza hacker just trying to maximize that corner and not go wide they're afraid of the outside wall they hit the inside wall and that has brought Tazvinza hacker into the pit lane again that car has been towed back to the garage and uh, here is jordan bailey who continues to enjoy no man's land john you'll be familiar with the position he's in He's in the John Dalton zone. Yeah, fully in the John Dalton zone is, is daily at the moment. He's some two and a half seconds to the good of the car ahead. And uh, the car behind, 11 seconds to the good. So almost sat in no man's land, just trying to put in consistent lap times and see if the uh, consistency can lead to any results later on down the road. Uh, the Tatsumina Hacker replay was uh, some 10 minutes ago uh, that incident happened. Again, grazing the wall ever so slightly through sunset. Um, just uh, speaking to Tatsumina Hacker, actually sent him a message after it did happen just for a comment uh, he says he signed up an hour before the event so wasn't really looking to be too, too competitive and remembers why he uh, doesn't gel quite well with iRacing he said uh, he thinks he was <laughs> scraping the walls already killed my tyres and just wasn't having fun very unfortunate indeed but again Tatsumina Hacker very accomplished ACC driver again two very different sims Assetto Corsa Competizione and iRacing again GT Racing LMP2 Racing very different kettles of fish between the two and uh, Felix just not having a good time today so he has decided to park the car before it gets too late in the session but of course the uh, Williams stroke Hymo setup driver put on a good show for real uh, we've got FCR aspect in the chat um, it's in fact of course Miller um, but he's already commented in the discord but just confirming to the YouTube chat the uh, wheel has snapped off his base uh, so can't actually physically finish the race very unfortunate there and this is how it all came undone in turn 10 jumped on the brakes locked oh, the yeah. rears again by the looks of it off to drivers left again managed to get it going jesse but if you remember then found himself parked on the inside of uh, turn 11 and then of course the uh, message came through about the snapped wheelbase so very unfortunate there uh, but as you say jesse never heard of a wheelbase snapping 
Normally, of course, wheelbases fail. They stop sending signals, force feedback, maybe dies. Uh, they still work, but again, never ever heard of one snapping. So very interesting there. Very unfortunate, but fingers crossed you do manage to get that one fixed. And we might even see you back in RCI very soon indeed. Race replay, I think this is, of Fabian Schmidberger. We caught this just a few laps ago, of course, jumping on the brakes into turn seven. Round he went, went to go. Oh, a little bit of a car park coming in there. That was a very tricky oh. one. And again, Erkma out of turn one. That's a big spin for the Triple R driver. Saved it. Very stylish indeed, Jesse. Nearly managed to complete 360. Les Stevenson flying past there, keeping it out of trouble. And uh, here we are back with live pictures again. So, uh, you know, a lot of drivers, Jesse, being very challenged by Sebring this afternoon. And uh, again, not quite finding their feet as much as we thought they would, of course, in the uh, the realms of iRacing. But, you know, like we just said with Felix, LMP racing, GTPs and, you know, GT3 racing, which a lot of these drivers are accustomed to. Again, a lot of drivers coming over from uh, obviously our main game at RCI being ACC. But coming into the realm of iRacing, it's a very different kettle of fish than what they're used to. Yeah, it's very much a case of how hard could it possibly be. And the answer is uh, quite hard. In fact, I think a lot of people think, uh, and I'm not saying this is uh, Tivin's a hacker at all. I don't think, uh, oh, the rain's here. The rain is absolutely here. Raindrops falling on the pitch straight. And now they're catching up to turns three, four, and five, the section we're going through now. As the weather starts to come in and out of the area, this racetrack may deteriorate uh, somewhat quickly. The wind picking up, you can see the, the Florida palm trees going a little bit sideways as the storm's blowing in. And it's just now starting the windscreen wipers on. And this is probably the most advantageous time as long as this track starts to take on a little bit of moisture here sometime soon. I think pretty much everybody will be able to get away with this by coming into the pit lane and not disrupting a particularly. Let's see what happens here. Oh, just gets the braking wrong. Does the Cadillac Holland nearly into the back of, uh, was that? Uh, was that uh, I think it was Schmidberger. Was it now? I think it was the uh, nearly on pace car, the Fabian Schmidberger. It looked like the Cadillac just caught it a little bit too fast, Jesse, of course, uh, GTP is coming in very much quicker than the LMP2 cars arrive in to turns and kind of like maybe just having to apply a little bit more brake than they're used to and just caught the lock up there and turned around. So both drivers surviving, although the Cadillac with a big time loss here, um, although that has allowed Herford Smith through into P3 in the number 349, the uh, Stars and Stripes livery, Jesse. You're probably uh, saluting the screen right now as we see the United States flag on the uh, the, the tail fin of that Get car. Get out of my ahead. room. Just cutting, through the, uh, just cutting through the traffic there again. Both drivers having to play it very sensibly indeed, especially with these mixed conditions. Arriving at corners, you're not too sure how much grip the car is going to have. And, uh, of course, it's a, a bit of a, a tiptoe exercise, isn't it, seeing how far... You can really push the car on these dry tires. A few drivers, as you alluded to earlier, Jesse, already on the wet tire. Again, indicated by the, the blue tire icon on the far right-hand side of the timing tower on the left-hand side of your screen. So those drivers probably going to be going a little bit quicker than the rest of the cars already in wet. the build. But the track's already wet. Look, rain, rain is here. There's still spray coming off, and standing water is going to become a big problem in the next few laps, Jesse. Drivers are going to have to think about when are they going to come down the pit lane for those wet tires. Already a tricky race with the newer GTP cars, as I was earlier alluding to. How hard could it be? Well, it's quite difficult. You're managing the electrical hybrid drive charge. You're managing the lack of more sophisticated electronic aids. And now on top of that, iRacing's newest obstacle in your way. Uh, of course, managing a very difficult, per perhaps the most difficult racetrack in uh, sports car racing uh, is Sebring and now the newest trick in the iRacing toy box it's rain and it is here in a big way the I can tell you the palm trees and the flags are uh, flying completely sideways right now as this storm is blowing over the racetrack here lucky to be inside lucky there's no open top uh, sports cars anymore in racing the thing of a bygone era of course more than a decade ago but uh, 
many drivers have already bailed. Kampferger, Jong, Edwards, Schmidberger, Carlson, all on the wet tire in LMP2, the top three in that class. Macha, Dijkstra, and Brown now have yet to come in. Uh, Vigesque, excuse me, has just come in to put on the wet tire. Lidgard has done the very same. Only two cars in GTD have come in to put on wet tires. Tom Bryan and Joe Dauber have done exactly that. And the one car in GTP, that being the 191, that now has Mayer behind the wheel in that Cadillac. So those are the cars that have currently come in. Oh, no, Urkla has just come in as well to put on the wet tires. Everybody's got to come in eventually. I would have thought a lap ago would have been the right time, especially with this spray, but look at this. Holland on the back of Herford Smith, and you can see the spray, and that is dynamic on the windscreen, folks. The, the raindrops move in the direction, the opposite direction of where you're pointing the race car, and when you're behind a car, it adds extra rain on the windscreen. And of course, the spray in general is its own distraction. I'd be very surprised if these drivers here take another lap. Yeah, very surprised indeed, Jesse. It looks very treacherous out there at the moment. You see both drivers electing to come down pit lane alongside another GTD car ahead. I think that was a, a BMW M4 GT3. It was indeed. Uh, looks maybe like a Tom Bryant car, but I could be wrong because he's on an outlap at the moment. So that, in theory, is going to be Hillbeam in the number 242 down pit lane. We've got some uh, race replays coming in here. Uh, this is Erkma yeah, leaving lane. the pits in the Triple R and just finding himself around in turn one, Jesse. Again, cold tyres on the, the, the race surface and again through the bumpiest turn of turn one. It's uh, not going to be a recipe for fun in the 963. Managed to get it underway again. And here we go with another race replay. This this, this time, this is uh, Les Stevenson uh, coming down into the bottom end of the circuit. This is turn seven. Uh, skates it a little bit wide through turn seven. Managed just to get it under control. And out he goes through eight and nine. And I'm not sure what's happened there, but we've got Kevin Boss this time. Again, turn seven. Uh, looks Ooh, like he's come in a little bit too hot. Big armful of understeer. You're almost better kind of straightening the wheel off at that point and going for the escape road uh, down to the driver's left. And you see how fast the uh, conditions have changed, Jesse. It's already looking much, much darker down towards the uh, turn 16 of Le Mans before the back straightaway, essentially towards the, uh, the turn of sunset bend. But... Certainly no sunsets to be had here at the moment. Um, just chatting, obviously, you were earlier about the uh, the driver changes again in the cars. Again, we've got, uh, of course, Schmidberger out, uh, Hatch from uh, Vigishway uh, into the number 81 now. Um, we gave the drivers a choice. Do they want to do this solo or do they want to do this as a team? And the majority of the drivers on the field today will be solo. However, uh, nearly on pace, uh, they've got Oliver Hackstrom, Vicar Huey and Fabian Schmidberger. Sim Brothers Racing electing for a duo of Andreas Carlson and Eric Engman. Uh, we then got Drift King Motorsport with uh, Yaroslav Sindelar and Patrick Meyer. We've got Scuderia Pepperoni Diavola with Omar Tomasi and uh, Thomas Van Zanten. Uh, we've got the FCR Featherclaw uh, Louise with Louise Gordon and Robbie Lidgard. Rebound Racing, of course, Joe Dorber and Theobald Roskam. And uh, the most catchiest name in the field today, I I'm sure you'll agree with me here, Jesse. We're testing for Sebring after this race uh, with Andrew Harvey and uh, Philip Hahn aboard that car. So the majority of the field, other than six, all electing for a solo effort here for two hours 40, which is going to be interesting. Come the end of the race, are the two driver teams going to be a little bit more alert, a little bit more fresh, and maybe have that little bit extra pace to make up those all important positions before the checkered? I'll tell you what I would do as somebody who's been on the short end of the stick, if I was the driver that got in second after an hour of very nice dry weather racing and you hand the car over to me immediately, as it starts chucking it down, and especially in the middle of a fight with a couple of other cars, I'd be absolutely fuming about that, that uh, the good weather was used up on driver one, and now I have to deal with this. But, uh, you know, uh, maybe not, though, considering this is a new thing. A lot of the GTP drivers this week that I've had the, uh, I've had the, the pleasure of talking to, and on top of that, just a, a lot of the GTP drivers, uh, the streamers, as well have all said the same thing just about these gtps are insanely difficult to handle our own broadcaster ash Bibby reckons that some of these lmp2s will be just as quick as gtps around here 
in the wet, if not quicker as well. So watch out for that. That could make uh, blue flag lap traffic a bit more difficult. You could see some weird scenarios as well with LMP2s overtaking GTPs. And uh, that would just further complicate the pie. Several cars have uh, been involved in an incident from multiple classes here. Let's show you the replay of what's happened here. And yes, indeed, the GTP and LMP2 class fighting. Vigas Quay tries to stay out of the way. He gets onto the grass and spins the number 81 car around, and they will continue on. And at the same time, Kevin Boss having another issue here, looping the car, just a little bit too much uh, right foot action right there. Yeah, exit of turn five that was. Uh, this time we've got uh, Harvey aboard, of course, uh, giving way from Philip Han. Again, Han had some issues down into turn seven, and Harvey is no different, uh, looping the car around. That's the uh, we're testing for Sebring after this race team aboard there. And you see Kevin Boss as well having to do a little bit of rallycross and spinning <laughs> the uh, BMW hybrid there. This is the uh, replay of what's happened to Kevin Boss. He's come in, of course, he's probably seen the, uh, the Han car, the Harvey car parked on the outside and thought, hey, I'm not making this corner. I'm going to need to take some avoiding action. And uh, this time, this is Hyla uh, coming in to what I believe is turn 13 of Tower. Oh. Way too hot, Jesse Lee, and, and bounced off the tire wall. The uh, the whole clip of that car completely disappearing. Hyla immediately tows back to the garage and then DNFs. So I'm very unfortunate there. Another casualty of the LMP2 class alongside Tatsvina Hacker. Yeah, something happened to Mayer as well. I'm not entirely sure what occurred. They were about 15 or so seconds behind Surinac in the Porsche leading this race overall. But I suspect if I had to guess that number 191 Acura just drove off the racetrack a little bit and had to find their way back onto the course. Well, we'll uh, stay with you here in sound only as we uh, trace back some... Uh...
Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to wherever you are, of course, in the world at the moment. Uh, we're with some technical difficulties uh, at the moment with our iRacing broadcast. Very unfortunate indeed. Uh, two hours 40 of Sebring on the cards today. And typically, as the heavens opened, it started playing haywire with our stream. So our broadcaster, Ash Bibby, has just gotten away quickly to uh, restart his PC. And hopefully, we'll be bringing you the iRacing back very, very shortly indeed. But thanks for sticking with us during this time. Jesse Lee has managed to uh, take over very briefly on broadcasting duties while we await Ash's return. Uh, but yeah, plenty of action was happening as we saw the heavens opened, of course. Cars spinning off left, right and centre. Lots of cars electing to dive down the pit lane as well. So hopefully we'll be uh, back with the action very shortly indeed. Uh, RCI calendar this week, of course, lots going on in the <laughs> in the evening. We're, uh, we're back uh, to uh, tonight with ACC with Night Owl Season 17, continuing at Paul Ricard for round three. Uh, next week on Monday continues, of course, with the uh, Monday Multiclass Madness. That's GT4 and TCX once again in the realm of ACC. Last week saw John Eraser uh, beating Azure Goat and Grim Lilith in GT4 with Raphael Huell and Victor Nordquist beating Nico Kumpu in TCX. Uh, Midweek Masters uh, has been postponed for another week until signups, uh, of course, pick up a little bit for that one. So, if you do want to get involved in some midweek racing, uh, Wednesdays will be the slot for you. Uh, Thursday, we're back here at Sebring for the final round of the iRacing IMSA Season 1. And Friday, we'll begin our brand new KTM Master Series in ACC. Uh, GT2 or GT4, pick your poison. And we'll see how this one goes down with round one taking place at Brands Hatch. And then a week today, next Saturday, it's another double header, but this time with World Tour 2024 beginning at the Nürburgring GP with pre-qualifying still going on for that one. So if you are listening in and you've forgotten, hang on a minute, I've not done my laps. Uh, jump on the server and get those lodged because the clock is ticking before, of course, we then head back in the evening to Saturday Night Owl Round 4 at Indianapolis. So you can, of course, check out any of those events at any time uh, by visiting our racerci.com on the uh, on the website. And I believe Ash Bibby is back with us. So while we do get set up again, and fingers crossed, it all goes to plan uh, this time. And uh, we'll be back with some iRacing very shortly. But of course, a big thank you to you guys at home for sticking around. Uh, thank you for uh, for coming through this journey with us uh, in the world of iRacing. Of course, not always everything goes smoothly in the world of broadcasting so we appreciate your patience there of course a quick uh, message from our partners again bottom left hand side of the screen they've been scrolling through the entirety of the broadcast of course aka esports a uh, leading italian company in esports management and organization across the world uh, founded in 2005 and uh, establishing itself as a point of reference in the hardware sector with 2018 debuting their first official Porsche Esports Championship and since then has found success with SRO, Delara and many other brands, including us here at RCI for providing our service solutions. So we thank them very much indeed. At Drivers61.com, you can of course get 25% off your driver coaching by using our discount code uh, down below and heading on over to Drivers61.com. Uh, Fanatec, again, needs no introduction to who they are, one of the leading brands in dedicated sim racing hardware. There is an RCI affiliate link down in the description below, so be sure to uh, check that out. Uh, check that out, sorry, if you are looking to pick up any new hardware in 2024. Um, digitalmotorsports.com again a new partner to us joining just last year uh, offers a number of products and services from uh, virtual driving experiences corporate events an early drive program esports championships driver training and even simulator components including complete sim rig solutions founded in 2018 by two enthusiastic motorsports fans they had a vision to create ireland's leading digital motorsport environment and resource uh, visit the link down below if you think they can help you out at all and lastly, but no means least, of course, uh, Go Setups, formed to be a, a premium esports setup store for Assetto Corsa Competizione. Of course, uh, their primary aim was to create setups for all skill levels, whether you're esports ready, looking for a safe alternative for your favorite car, and featuring a plethora of esports stars on their team. You can be sure that the setup you choose has extensive hours behind it. And uh, just this week, another update from uh, the 1.9.8 ready. Uh, Lamborghini Huracan GT3 Evo, the 720S and the Jaguar all receiving their Red Bull Ring setups. And of course, uh, tweaks to the 1.9.8 patch. So 
get yourselves involved with those guys if you are looking for uh, kind of a leading edge, shall we say, in the uh, competition uh, alongside, of course, uh, anybody that you're fighting. You may find some extra pace that you never quite knew you had. As uh, we, of course, are still bearing with Ash Bibby as he tries to get set up again to bring you iRacing uh, racing action. And I've just been told in my ear that we are ready to switch. So hopefully we're going to go quiet for a couple of minutes. And then when we come back, we should be back with Sebring Scenes. And uh, fingers crossed we can bring you all the latest action from the two hours, 40 minutes. Bear with us while we do so. And welcome back to a very rainy and wet Sebring. This is the RCI two hour, 40 minute race here. The series one off here, IMSA cars on the track and it's become a very treacherous affair after what was a mixed condition practice and quality session. It was a mostly dry start of the race, the first hour. And now the heavens have absolutely opened. And if you're on the florist tour, uh, the Florida tourist board, I can tell you uh, this doesn't happen ever here. It's always bright sunshine. Uh, that's a complete lie. But uh, the old saying, if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes. It'll change. Absolutely the case. Jesse Lee, John Dalton back with you. Ash Bibby back behind the cameras. And we have a very wet race going on. Here is your leader, Saranac. And oh, they've just had a big spin. Just as we've come back down the back straight or the wet pit lane, they've hit into the wall quite majorly. Mayer is catching up. That was a 22, 23 second gap. And it's all but a race now. Major damage to the front of the leading 17 Porsche. Yeah, not good for uh, Suranak, of course, there. A little bit too much exit curve, maybe still very, very wet on the circuit and even wetter, I would say, on the curbing, Jesse, and just nabbing the throttle of that 963. And in the background there, you see Mayer coming out of Sunset Bend, just four seconds behind now. And uh, the, the lead gap has certainly come down for Suranak. So he's going to have to be very cautious for the next few laps. Going to have to get some consistent laps under his belt and get that Porsche back to where it needs to be very much at the helm of the field. Two minutes, 11 last time by for Suranak with that mistake. And of course, two minutes, 3.6 last time by from Mayer and another mistake from Suranak he's off in turn five backs oh. it against the wall the wing has dropped off the car but then gone back onto the rear deck and I think that's going to be some big rear end damage as Mayer goes through into the lead of GTP and uh Suranak's going to have to come down the pit lane oh, surely that, Jesse that 963 yeah, is not going to be good well it's been broken I've just realized uh, based on the way the front wheels look that's misaligned I don't think that happened on the most recent incident 
I think that happened on the first one, and it just got away from them a little bit. This is major damage. This is major drama for your race leader in the 17 Porsche, and now it's all gone back the way of the lone Acura in the GTP class. I talk so much about Sindelar. I talk so much about that team, how they've not always been the quickest in the IMSA series that we run here on RCI Thursdays. They haven't had to be. They're just consistent. They've given up time when they've had to. They've not made big mistakes. And it looked like it was going all Surinac's way. And it's all come undone here all in the span of one lap. Blink and you'll miss it. And it's all gone wrong. That car's definitely misaligned. A bent toe link, a broken something. The rear wheels seem to be tracking truth. The front ones I'm concerned about. Of course, the rear wing of that car is going to be heavily damaged as well. This is going to be an unscheduled stop for the 17. Yeah, unscheduled indeed, as we've uh, got a couple of replays coming up here. This is Kevin Boss down into turn seven again. We saw him with some troubles earlier on Jesse, and this time a little bit too eager on the brakes. And, of course, just looping the BMW around uh, gets it facing the right way, although a very... Uh, very sketchy rejoin there, part lengthways on the apex. That was uh, that was Holland and Hereford Smith coming through in the two Cadillacs. That's P3 and P4 uh, overall in GTP and uh, doing some very sensible stuff there to wait for everybody to pass before getting going again. This time we've got Erkma down into turn seven and again almost a mirror of Kevin Boss, although managing to whip the rear end round slightly more aggressively to get the car facing the right way again and the Triple R driver will get underway. Way. This time we've of course got Harvey uh, in the LMP2 car down into turn seven again and almost uh, a kind of one to one from what we've seen from Harvey and of course uh, Philip Hahn both sharing that number 13 car and uh, very unfortunate indeed turn seven Jesse proving to be very tricky indeed meanwhile at the uh, the latter half of the circuit that's oh. Dijkstra and PCDC that's contact with Tomasi in the number 521 Porsche that's a hard lick into the wall and it's such a shame that car was running so well and now you can see the uh, front end ever so slightly misaligned on that one so again another unscheduled stop down pit road for the number 521. You know, if you'd have asked what I thought the problem corner was going to be here today, I would have probably said, and most of our audience would have probably said, probably Sunset Bend, this uh, very corner we're in right now. But I would have also said uh, turn seven, the hairpin, which isn't really a hairpin, but we're going to digress from that, would uh, be a secondary spot. A lot of cars coming together. That hasn't been the case, though. I'd have been wrong in that instance. It's been a lot of misjudgment. It is, it's a weird corner because it, it feels like a hairpin, but in reality, you don't go 90, or excuse me, a full 180. You go closer to maybe 75 degrees, but it's such a strange corner. It, you just you think you can break later than you can. A lot of the prototypes in the dry were getting in trouble there because they were trying to turn and break, which is not the strong suit of that car with no ABS. They get behind on their braking and they try to turn in to sort of uh, bleed some of the speed and it doesn't work. And here's a GTD going a little bit wide. That's what traction control and ABS does where you don't go sliding off the racetrack, but you do absolutely hemorrhage time. Bullwinkle, who at one point was inside the top three, has fallen down through the field, clearly not uh, enjoying the rain. And that car looks a bit damaged as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, lots of cars in the walls at the moment. It's going to be, you know, very tricky conditions currently to what they're maybe used to. Again, some drivers, I imagine a lot of drivers have dabbled in the wet when the update did come out jesse of course uh, in sim racing when we get something new we love to go absolutely bananas about it and ooh, you know shiny. drive nothing but yeah exactly oh shiny let's play with this uh, non-stop for a couple of hours and uh let's see what we can truly do but uh yeah of course lots of drivers probably practicing in uh you know playing about with the wet weather but maybe like you said earlier on in the broadcast not fully committing to uh long stints in the wet so they don't quite know how the wet tires evolve how the uh, stint evolves as we see Les Stevenson here down into turn seven of the Porsche. Again, it's a rear weighted car, all the uh, weight over the back axle. So great traction, probably out of the corners, getting into the corners, trying to get the uh, front axle loaded up. Maybe not so much indeed. And uh, I think this is a, a race replay. 
possibly that we're saying no nope, we're back to live here um fabian schmidberger in the chat jesse lee it's a name we've not seen in a while we said earlier on in the broadcast an update from the nearly on pace team unfortunately have had to retire the car but has added that this is very fun indeed yeah, it certainly is. The rain, by the way, has uh, sort of calmed down for the moment. I can't see any raindrops falling. That is also helping a run-in. I wouldn't call it a dry line by any means, but it's a run-in line. The sun's starting to peak out. Jordan Daly there, as you just saw, missing the corner there, but luckily was able to take a little bit of the escape road and just about get away with it. Unfortunately, Rafier has been able to overtake Daly. Daly down outside the top five and a huge slide here by bullwinkle and near contact was able to just actually that wasn't bullwinkle that's brown in fact in the number 99 i don't know why don't know where i got a gtd car out of a bunch of prototypes there uh harvey same place same song in fact it's another lazy spin for the number 13 that is starting to encroach on groundhog day territory john you ever seen that film yeah you know every every turn seven feels the same maybe at the moment for the number 13 always coming in backwards <laughs> uh, looping it around way. parking it and of course getting it underway again i've just realized uh the bullwinkle car uh down in p5 of gtd uh the livery of that one is in a cartoon kind of etched style to what we've seen of course from the uh the Mercedes team at the Nürburgring 24 with the uh, cartoonized kind of Bilstein livery. Uh, very much the same for Bullwinkle, but it's uh, a BMW factory uh, colored livery. And it's only just occurred to me since it's been raining. So the dynamics of the car have changed enough to uh, to show the cartoon shading on the car, which is uh, very good indeed. And I'm always a big fan of liveries in uh, ACC iRacing. You know, the small touches, the small kind of bonus hidden features that people put in them are fantastic to see especially from a, a broadcasting point of view but yeah definitely some cartoonized shading on that car i would say perhaps it's a bit like a mood ring uh you know it uh, reacts to the humidity <laughs> in the air a little bit uh, going on there i thought you were going to make a reference uh, because you know bullwinkle is a is a quite famous cartoon and you were going to make a parallel there you did not and i'm quite proud of you for not doing so but yeah it does it looks like a, the, the factory bmw livery but you actually get close to it it's got some shading done to the car. Uh, you see what you're doing there with the uh, car. Pastel, almost. Uh, I'm, pretty sure. I'm not an art guy, so I'm pretty sure I'm screwing that up. But uh, that's what it looks like. It looks like it's been painted with watercolor or sort of a pastel. Well, the rain has gone away for the time being. Welcome to Florida. Uh, but the track still very, very much wet. There's a run in line that isn't dry, but certainly will aid your adhesion to the surface a couple of cars i do fear have just went off the track momentarily and we've been able to rejoin again a couple of early retirements in today's race and a couple of uh, very bizarre incidents indeed speaking of here goes Irkma again but still hasn't hit anything majorly a, a couple of spins for umas Irkma but nothing that would take them out of this race they keep plugging along in the number triple three porsche yeah, it's the main thing, isn't it? You know, if you do have an incident, try and keep it out of the wall because we've seen a lot of cars in the uh, the concrete. We've seen them in the, the tire bales, you know, rebounding out. We've seen a car coming back across the front of the GTDs. There's been, you know, lots of big incidents so far, but uh, it just seems to kind of spin the car and keep it relatively out of any kind of damage, of course. The only damage thing being maybe Ego and uh, the tires underneath them. But yeah, the Triple Three still soldiering around, still plodding along. And uh, still in P7 uh, overall will be a lap down from our leaders. But we said earlier, didn't we, Jesse, about the uh, the lap times, of course, between the GTPs and the uh, LMP2s. And the LMP2s have been lapping a lot faster so far than the GTPs. But, of course, with the weather subsiding, hopefully we should see the, uh, the GTPs stretching their legs a little bit more once this circuit dries up. But still, very tricky for all I'm involved. As we see a big wiggle there from Herford Smith as you began your salute, Jesse. Just caught a patch of standing water. I can only imagine towards the, uh, the latter half of the lap through the uh, turn 14-15 section. A uh, big wiggle and uh, managed to find their way out to the concrete and back on again. That's going to be a slight time loss there for Herford Smith. Of course, uh, Holland has been promoted up into P2 and Herford Smith 
into P3 after Surinac's incidences earlier. And uh, Kevin Boss, meanwhile, taking another spin in the BMW V8 hybrid there. Uh, not sure where this is in the lap. I think this could be around the uh, kind of west side of the circuit, maybe around turns 9 and 10, uh, somewhere around there. But yeah, Kevin Boss getting back underway again and into turn 7, the uh, the problematic corner, shall we say, of today. As we said earlier, the uh, the turn, turn 1 and Sunset Bend, we thought would be the problematic corner, but it has, of course, been turn 7 as Ke uh, Ted Edwards sorry, comes in far too hot there. And uh, Zhong in the number 47 manages to uh, slot themselves up the inside, and they find themselves in P5 overall in LMP2. You know, it's uh, somewhat humorous, but potentially not if you're Kevin Boss as... Holland has just had an incident out of P2, and I worry that uh, Herford Smith has been involved in the very same incident. We'll see as we have a replay. Here's Holland. Uh, no Herford Smith to speak of thus far, just going to outdo themselves into turn seven. They're backwards. Herford Smith's going to go off the racetrack as well. A little bit more extreme. Herford Smith's going to take the access road back onto the racetrack, but no contact rather besides huge slide here for Irkma. How on earth does the triple R car continue to spin in that fashion and not take anything out? But you know what? Irkma has decided that now is the appropriate time to come in and change those tires. Now they haven't put dry tires on that uh, triple three triple R Porsche. That is a fresh set of wet tires which uh, well if you are going to pit there i don't think you had much of a choice the track's still too wet to test those dry tires yeah how Erkma keeps doing this where they're, they're they're spinning and they're keeping out of the wall time and time again i will never know but of course the uh the tires taking an absolute battering in the last stint so Erkma probably electing to come down pit lane to get rid of those flat spots as we see uh Jean there make light work of the triple r car down into turn seven of course the uh the passing place of the day should we say through maybe driver's error and of course it's a, a very easy corner to uh, get yourself towards the inside and, and kind of cut off the apex before you of course get to it i'm um, just touching on today's race of course we haven't really mentioned this but um there is no stint timers and no mandatory pit stops required so the uh, the length of your stint should we say uh, is determined by how far you can either go on a set of tires or to a tank of fuel so uh you know that's very interesting indeed especially with the weather at the moment we've got a yellow flag out for bullwinkle in the number 27 he gets back underway and clears that relatively quickly so i can only assume that's either a, a wheel dip somewhere or maybe a, a half lazy spin uh, that we keep seeing but riding on board with the gtp you can really see how much you got to be alert here to the standing water and how smooth you have to be on the steering inputs again uh Erkma there just very so slightly making corrections and straightening out the car punching the throttle as we head down towards the uh the sunset bend 10 17 down what is essentially known as the wec pit lane of course uh, when wet did visit here just last year the uh the pit lane changed from the other side of the circuit to where we are now Again, through the last turn, you can see how you know, bumpy and undulating the, uh, the road is, how much the suspension is working in the front left wheel well of that Porsche 963. And uh, Erkma trying to find either standing water to cool those tyres or allowing Ted Edwards through, actually. Uh, didn't see that one coming, but uh, Ted there going through. And uh, this is what we said earlier, Jesse, didn't we, about the GTPs being that much slower when the uh, heavens open and the circuit gets wet. It's really tricky to uh, control these cars, as we see there, Erkma again. Again, making a slight mistake into turn three, just out breaking themselves, running a little bit wide, but Ted Edwards there through and already galloping away into the distance. There's been some level of drama. The former leader of the race, Suranak, has retired the number 17 Porsche, and that happened just a moment ago. The big slide here. I don't think they're going to hit anything, but that car is going to be towed to the pit lane, and that team has left the racetrack. Now, they could in theory rejoin at some point but uh, oh my goodness jordan daly getting spun there a little bit loose uh, exiting the corner the car behind them didn't even look like they attempted to slow down and just uh, applied the old chrome horn and kept going but former leader of the race overall Suranak out of the race tom bryan in fourth place in gtd loops it in turn 17 a little bit of contact with the inside wall and they will continue as 
well. Yeah, so lots of uh, people getting caught out at the moment, of course, with the uh, the tricky kind of changing conditions. Of course, grey skies have blown away. The uh, the sunset nature of Sebring has resumed. And uh, Tom Bryant there just getting in the way ever so slightly of your P2. <laughs> uh, I think that's P2 Holland uh, just behind there, trying to find a way through in the Cadillac. But yeah, Tom just trying to find any kind of grip that they can, of course, on the road at the moment. I'm not sure if that BMW M4 is damaged, but again, Herford Smith will now be the next car to try and dispatch of Tom Bryant. Meanwhile, uh, Jean, with some excellent pace, Jesse, just look at the uh, last lap times here. Carlson ahead, 203.6, and uh, Jean there, oh, oh getting scary. cut off. Getting cut off there by the rebound racing car. I think that's Joe Dorber in the 777. A little bit unaware Good of maybe the, uh, the how much Jong was catching through turn one. Of course, the uh, LMP2 cars, much higher levels of downforce, can take a lot more speed through turn one than you can in the GTD. And Joe Dorber there just getting caught out by how fast Jong was closing. But no harm, no foul. I was going to say uh, excellent pace from these uh, LMP2 drivers, Ted Edwards and Jong. Catching Carlson, of course, 203.6 last time by. Jong was 159.6 and Ted Edwards, 159.3. Um, so, yeah, excellent pace from the LMP2s as kind of expected. And uh, Jong there now dispatches of Joe Dorber. But a very hairy moment indeed. As you said, Jesse, very well saved by Jong. Did well not to panic and, you know, put himself into the tyre wall. And next up will be uh, Les Stevenson in the GTD Porsche. And there's a wiggle from Les as he hits a patch of standing water. I think there was contact between the number 47 and the 446. Only time will tell on that one. But uh, yeah, very hairy moments at the moment with the, uh, the the conditions changing, Jesse. A lot of drivers being caught out by the uh, standing water and mixed grip that is on the circuit currently. Not the misconception about racing. The most dangerous time is not when it's raining and uh, the conditions are holding. The most dangerous time is when the track is going through some sort of change or progression. And this is Bullwinkle just moments ago was running in, I believe, fourth place. And shades of Tom Bryant, just a huge slide. Doesn't hit anything, does Bullwinkle. He's going to have to drive across the entirety of the track to get going and keeps going. So I didn't see Tom Bryant go through. So I'm willing to believe Bullwinkle was already in fifth by that time. Slide here by Kevin Boss again. Does he touch the wall? No, he doesn't. He avoids the tire pack and the Armco. It is I, a penny for Kevin Boss's thoughts post-race here today. Third place in LMP2. Kamferger does almost the same thing that Young did, except that Young was trying to avoid assaulting a slower class car. And huge one here from Daly, carrying way too much speed and makes it into the barrier. I think this is on the outside of turn one. Yeah, it looks like turn one there, Jesse. Daly just a little bit too hot. And uh, Erkma may be about to do the Replay? same thing. Let's have a look. It's almost a one-to-one, -one, but a bit later on in the oh, turn. And finally, the triple three damage. makes contact with the wall. And I'm sure they're going to be back to the pit lane very shortly indeed. Yeah, instant tow back to the pit lane there. Kevin Boss also with a toe and uh, Surinac, of course, like you say, with the DNF. So very unfortunate there. Uh, Van Stone has also DNF'd in the GTD category. Not sure how long ago that happened, but must have been quite some very time early. ago now as uh, Raffier finds his way through on Bullwinkle into Sunset Bend. And a lot of the drivers being caught out, Jesse, I think, by these mixed conditions. Of course, one minute you've got lots of grip in the wet tires, you hit a puddle of standing water, suddenly you slightly aquaplane, you then have to lift off or brake or try and, you know, keep the car under control in some manner. And of course, the uh, the sharper inputs of the uh, the pedals or the steering really causing havoc for these cars. But you can see just how cautious uh, Raffier was through turn one then. And I think caution might be the uh, aim of the game at the moment as the circuit begins to dry out. No, it certainly is. We talked about the Acura team, Mayor behind the wheel of that with a team teamed up with Sindelar. That's how they've won a lot of the iRacing Thursday races here at RCI is just being nice, calm, cool, and collected and not making any of the mistakes. Erkma and Boss, by the way, in that GTP category, after their most recent incidents, they have towed those race cars. I, I'm almost certain Erkma had some sort of suspension damage, would have had to driven around the entire racetrack because they crashed into turn one. They'd elected to tow rather uh, beside and uh, Kevin Boss has done a similar thing. Now, they have not DNF. They've just towed. They're going to do some repairs to those race cars. 
and get back out there. Camferger, by the way, remember they were uh, involved in a, I wouldn't call it an accident. They just ran a little bit deep into turn three. They brought that car in. They're the first car in the race, that LMP2, uh, number 46, Delara. They're the first one out there on dry tires. We're close to the crossover point, and nobody's going to be able to tell us how close we are better than Camferger. We're looking at anything that's a sub 156, 155, a 154 would be absolutely ideal. I don't think we're going to get that in this condition quite yet, but if Camferger can go out there and run a 156, 155, that might trigger a bunch of drivers coming in to switch off of the wet tire and put the dry tire on. We ride on board. Camferger in third place still on their outlap. Doesn't look too crazy right about now. Yeah, it's a little bit of confidence in the car. You could say right as I say that they hit a water patch, but what I was saying was a little bit of confidence. You can tell because if you weren't confident, you wouldn't be hitting the painted areas, the curbs, and he was. That was not ultimately his undoing right there. He had a he aquaplaned on a, on a, 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 a puddle not the curb itself. Bart Macha has bitten. The leader in LNP2 has brought the number five into pit lane. I can only imagine they're going to put dry tires on that car. That hands the lead over to Dykstra for the time being. Yeah, Dykstra with a fantastic comeback, of course, from the uh, the earlier on incident. And Drift King, Tom Bryant through Sunset Bend, makes it halfway around the corner before losing completely the back end of the M4. Manages to uh, loop it back around under the bridge. Thankfully, nobody uh, within earshot of Tom manages to get it back underway again. But, of course, heating up and scrubbing those wet tyres isn't going to be good for them. So, uh, Tom actively probably going to be trying to find standing water now to bring the uh, temperature down ever so slightly but again flat spots are of course going to be a thing for the number 244 but up in p4 at the moment of course bullwinkle has pitted uh very recently i, I think recently or he slipped down a position but tom bryant somehow finding his way just outside the podium there uh, with pillbeam being the uh, next car up the road lots of action in the uh, the lmp2 category of course lots of outs and uh, the lap number uh, displayed next to them is the last time they came down the pit lane so of course ted edwards and engman both down the lane at lap 40 as we see ted edwards there getting involved with the gtd traffic just behind he's got the gtp uh, this is battle for second and third essentially between holland and herford smith that's been kind of locked bumper to bumper for the majority of the race ted edwards still out on the wet tires uh, equally engman has elected for wet tires young again on the wet tires as well and uh, Bart Matcher on the wet tires still only can pregna out on the dry tires Jesse has he jumped too soon to take those dry tires I think we're gonna have to keep an eye on the lap time to see how it really unfolds for the number 46 of course the last lap time was a three minute lap that included the, the pit stop uh, quite interestingly to me, Bart Macha came in and off of pit road, you'll recall. That must have been a scheduled stop because they still have the wet tire. I assume a new set of wet tires on that car. A little bit of contact there with Ted Edwards uh, in tow as the GTP eventually makes their way through, but not before a little bit of contact. So Macha surrendered the lead in LMP2, did not go to the dry tire, put another set of wets on or didn't change tires at all. That could be down to the strategy. Macha is, at least according to our timing and scoring, they are right behind Dijkstra for the lead of the race uh, for the time being. So it's going to be interesting. I'm still waiting for that 46, the fourth place car in LMP2 to set a representative lap there. We're looking, uh, we would love a 156 to kind of tell us that the track is uh, equalizing or to a point where dry tires would be the most efficient. Of course, most of the drivers in the two minute lap times now, that's because they're doing pit stops and so forth. Dijkstra into the pit lane this time. He's on the pit exit as we speak. It should surrender first place back to Bark Macha who has led much of this stage of the race. Nobody in the GTP and the GTD field has made the jump to slick tires. Slide here from Joe Dauber and backs it into the wall, loses the wing for the moment. That's going to be massive aero damage to the back of the 777 Ferrari. 
Yeah, big aero damage indeed. And Joe Dorber back down the uh, back down the pit lane in the Ferrari 296 there, the triple seven uh, for rebound racing. Possibly going to hand it back to Theo about Ross Cam. We'll have to keep an eye on the leaderboard as uh, Cam Pregna there tries to make it through the GTD field. Uh, I think that's uh, Tomasi in the number 521. Uh, just ahead there, of course, uh, another car on the uh, wet tyres. It's going to be very kind of evident the uh, pace difference between the two in the slower stuff of course when you rely more on the uh, on the tire grip rather than the uh, of course the physical mechanical and aero grip that the car uh, kind of generates itself uh, again tires are very crucial and that's the difference there between the uh, wet and the dry tires we just saw a very clean move there around the outside of camp regna uh, not sure who that is that could be Possibly Lidgard in the number 623. Uh, just trying to work out what car that is, Jesse. It's uh, just out of shot every time it passes one of our cameras. But yeah, the difference there between the wet and the dry, it wasn't Lidgard. Uh, Lidgard is actually down at Sunset Bend as we see Harby uh, dive into the pit lane. The number 13 just out of shot there. Uh, comment in the YouTube channel. The green car at the back. Les Stevenson with some slow pace out of turn five. He is on dry tyres. Jesse, he's the first of the GTDs to uh, to take a set of drives. And it looks like Les is struggling very much so in the 992. Yeah, and if Kevin Boss was not a fan of Ash Bibby's uh, broadcast direct directing on Thursday for all the spins that he caught, well, boss, you can go ahead and skip the VOD on this one as well because uh, it's so nice. He's done it twice in one week. And, yeah, it's just one of those things that's frustrating as a race car driver when you can't figure out what's going on with the car, why it's handling the way it's handling. And in your mind, you're doing everything you possibly can. You're creeping up on corners because you get so gun shy after it happens a couple of times you don't keep pressing your luck because you're just further frustrating yourself and you're continuing to lose lose time and uh, even still you still have issues and uh, it's just impossible to understand but uh, Irkma and Boss still on the toe that's a long old toe as uh, they have not started a actual pit stop but yeah John as you as we saw and as it continues to happen Liz Stevenson having an absolutely horrible lap here i don't know if there's damage to that car oh just trying to stay to the inside don't know if there was contact with that prototype or maybe the wind just pulled them around but either way another slide for les stevenson who i can only imagine is trying to limp that car back to the pit lane well the verdict is in it's too early for the dry tires camfricker cannot do south of a two minute lap thus far and that car is on the struggle bus right about now. The good news is, because of the wet nature of the racetrack, the tire's not getting heated up, and it's not really taking a lot of the life out of the tire. The bad news is, 2 minute 7 is the slowest in their class by about 5 seconds. So that experiment has not gone the way of Kampferger in the 46. I think it's clear now. A little bit too early, but hey, at least they'll be the first out there on the dry tires and who knows what that may pay dividends for and they also may have been able to stay somewhat on the pit cycle that they wanted to stay on by doing that you never know it may seem like that's doomed them now but who knows in about an hour's time that might have set them up for a podium place you just can't tell in endurance racing like this yeah absolutely anything can happen in these endurance events and we say it time and time again during the uh, the ACC broadcast that you're never quite sure what's around the corner again. Traffic giveth and traffic taketh away. So again, traffic is a big, big factor in these events and managing it successfully is exactly what you need to do to avoid any major time loss. But that time still continuing to uh, tumble down, especially in the uh, LMP2 class. We're now under the 159 mark again. Just a few laps ago, we're still into the two minute realm. So we should hopefully see uh, Ken Bregner's tyres making a little bit of a gain up the field, but Dijkstra currently at the head of the field. Of course, Bart Matcher just behind, chasing him down. 1.5 seconds to the good, but Dijkstra 157 flat nearly, Jesse, and Bart Matcher last time by a 157.5, so half a second's difference. Both cars, of course, on the wet tyres. As you see, all of the arms were oh locked there, God. going into the hairpin. That was crossed over on That's itself, not Jesse. Normal. That's not normally we just see about I, 90 degrees or so, you know, maybe I, I, 180. I know, 
I know for 99% of the audience, that's a no kidding, Jesse, that's not normal. But for the, the 0.1% that thinks that that's okay, that's uh, what do they call that? They call that bro steer, I think they call that in sim racing these days. That was hand over hand, something you don't do in prototype racing that tells you that car's an absolute handful it got away from them right there but that also tells me with the the elegance uh, that they were able to sort of just drive away from that that's not the first time they've had to catch the car like that today yeah turn seven's been you know very problematic for a lot of drivers mainly on entry uh, rather than an exit but you know anything can happen in these races uh, dykstra currently coming up on a slower car uh, that's one of the uh, M4s, I believe, Tom Bryan, uh, just off there to drive his right. He's going to be on the awkward side of Sunset. Luckily, Tom breaks a little bit early, kind of gives the space to the LMP2. They can take the long, sweeping kind of outside line, then cut back in at the last minute. Meanwhile, the GPDs have to take a you know a slightly more conservative line, should we say. They don't quite have the uh, high levels of downforce that the LMP2 drivers have. And across the line, Dijkstra, 157.3. Meanwhile, Bart Matcher, a 157.7. So Dijkstra certainly looking like the uh, quicker car and the number 12 for PCDC Motorsport. And meanwhile, Dollars out in the Porsche, currently out front for GTD. Again, nobody really within earshot of him. Dominicus, some 15 seconds to the good. And then just behind him, Hillbeam, nearly 11 seconds to the good. And Dollars out, certainly the uh, fastest of the GTT, GTD, sorry, drives at the moment with that 2 minute 14.7. Again, Dominicus nearly a second off the uh, lap times of that Porsche. So uh, it's certainly going to be about consistency, Jesse, but. Obviously, you're going to have to make the right call on these tyres when it does come to your next pit stop. Do you elect to take the dries? Do you try and eke the wets out ever so slightly longer again? Just over an hour on the clock to go so far. And a uh, track still looking very, very wet and certainly lots of standing water still on the edge of the circuit. Certainly is. Mayor, the leader of the GTP and overall, the 191 Acura, the only Acura going back to the front a couple of lead changes in the race thus far mayor finds themselves in the lead i assume sindelar will get back in that car and finish up the race for the team as mayor's done the entire middle stint of it flashing the hwt bmw there as they go by now Irkma, by the way after the tow and the repair they have gone to the dry tire so that's the first gtp and there will be a couple of teammates or teams out there that will be paying attention to what Irkman is able to do on those tires les stevenson comes out on the dries and immediately smacks into the wall and slides to a halt i reckon that'll be an additional tow for les stevenson and it was and a slide here from Irkman on the way out and I don't think anybody is sold on the dry tire right about now. Bart Macha has just had a little bit of an incident as well. This is Brown, though, further back in the same class. Just going to go wide here in seven. You're going to hit the escape road and take the long way around. Oh, no, they're, they're heading back to Orlando, I think. There is they will do a five-point turn. It's on your driving test, kids. Might as well get some practice out there on the racetrack. I think he's parking up at a shade tree, you know. I think he's having a picnic with beans because that's what we do in this country. <laughs> I think and so, I Jesse. Have, I have upset every British person in the chat and in my ear. I wholeheartedly <laughs> apologize. Bart Macha, by the way, did have a bit of a moment. They were about one and a half seconds behind the leader in class and then this happened right here in yeehaw uh, strangely enough this little this little escapade here a couple of missed turns that was that was that lost them three or four seconds yeah very costly indeed for uh, bart matcher uh, brown's incident uh, reminds me very much so there's a famous clip a while ago of uh, i think it's a corvette c6 jesse uh, correct me if i'm wrong uh, doing a private track day here at Sebring. They stand on the brakes for turn seven and nothing happens. Uh, they find their way all the way down the escape road, under the bridge and out onto the public road. 
at the back of the circuit before they can finally get the car under control. So uh, Brown almost uh, doing a reenactment of that, shall we say, uh, on his incident. But I guess that's what happens on dry tyres when you do hit, of course, the uh, wettest part of the circuit of the escape roads where nobody is venturing, only a few cars now and again. So nothing really dispersing uh, out there. But Bart Matcher, of course, like you say, big time loss last time by. Let's have a look this time by on the lap timer. And again, it's a 158.9. So Bart really struggling with that car currently. Uh, Dijkstra out front, a 157.3. So extending the lead even more. Six seconds to the good now. And uh, Ted Edwards way out of earshot in P3. Some minute 10 behind uh, Bart Matcher. So lots of ground to gain for Edwards. But Edwards, of course, just behind Engman and uh, Yong are obviously close enough to, uh, you know, catch should Ted Edwards make any mistakes currently in this race. Uh, meanwhile, Campregna, oh, we've got, uh, that's uh, Erkma off to the uh, right-hand side again, the uh, triple three, triple R car finding its way off onto the grass and again i'm pretty sure manages to keep it out of the wall jesse let's have a look jumped on the power on the uh, the curbing and of course the four-wheel drive hybrid system probably not liking that one two variances of grip each side of the car uh, just throwing them off to uh, drivers right but again kept it out of the wall so again the uh, the triple three albeit with lots of pirouettes and spins today only one contact with the wall that we've managed to catch on the broadcast yeah, it's been an adventurous day for a lot of drivers. Gordon's joined us in chat to commiserate with Kevin Boss, saying that they're just out there trying to survive at this point. I think that speaks for most of the field. By the way, Holland, Herford, Smith, and also Erkma, who are with here, are all on the dries in that uh, Arafier as well in the number 19 in the GTP class. We've had Ted Edwards, who's joined Kampferger, and Brown on the dry tires and still the only GTD out there on the dries is Les Stevenson and nearly everybody who's gone out there early on the dry tires have absolutely paid for it thus far but more and more as the track is drying out the Florida sunshine beaming down they have decided that now is the right time to come in and I reckon the reason we haven't seen a dash to pit lane is, well, for one, the track's still somewhat wet. And number two, everybody wants to be within that window of only having to make this stop. Everybody trying to use that middle section of rain to their advantage to not have to come in for a splash and dash, only have to come in for one final complete service and finish the race, which talked about that very early on in the broadcast that some of these cars in my mind, particularly the GTPs, needed a little bit of help. Otherwise, they may absolutely have needed an extra couple liters of fuel in at the end. But because of the rain, because that slowed the pace down, I think everybody should, as long as they come in right about now, they should be able to make it to just about the end of the race. So if you're wondering why some of these cars are probably out there suffering on these old wets, it's simply to try and hit a number to get it done on pit lane and not have to come back again. Yeah, absolutely so. I mean, Bart Matcher there in the front of shot, just diving out of the pit lane ahead of uh, Pillbeam. Uh, he's elected to take the dry tires, Jesse. Uh, so Bart Matcher again into the, into the lane, out again on dry. So that should be the last stop for Bart. He's just obviously analyzed the circuit and thought, you know what, it's going to be good enough for the uh, dry tires now. And we've got Joe Dorber here in the uh, triple seven. This is out of turn 16. Uh, again, Joe Dorber finding his way sideways. That's the second time uh, we've managed to catch that one on broadcast. Manages to get going again just in front of Meyer. And uh, he finds his way through very safely indeed. Uh, this was Raffia earlier on. I think we just caught the, uh, the tail end of this one. Manages to keep it out of the tire bale. Uh, again, gets it under control and back on to the circuit. Uh, just behind, of course, Pilby. And then we've got Mark Brown here into the last turn of Sunset Bend. Just doesn't oh, quite get the one. turn in. And a big lick into the tire wall on the outside. That's the second time uh, we've seen that one. And this is uh, Han up the inside. Oh, Way no. too much speed coming in there. That's behind one of the BMWs. Possibly uh, either Bryant or Pillbeam in the 242 or the 244. Uh, manages to get going again and he finds his way down Pillbeam's the pit just lane. had an incident of their own. Yeah, say Pillbeam uh, just showing a yellow and Tomasi still showing a yellow briefly then when I began my next segment. Uh, but yeah, Engman 
currently in the 137 and it was Pillbeam. Here we go into the back of Tomasi. It was again in front of the race leader of Maya. Some very heads up driving there to avoid that one. And uh, both drivers there are trying to find their way back round facing the uh, correct way. No, you go first. No, you go first. And uh, both drivers there <laughs> getting back underway very safely indeed. And um, it's about that time in the broadcast. Uh, we haven't had a break uh, all broadcast due to the uh, technical difficulties earlier on, uh, but we are now going to grab ourselves a couple of minutes. Myself, uh, Jesse and Ash just going to dive off uh, to the uh, to the necessary break rooms uh, that we need to. And uh, we're going to leave you on board here currently with uh, Rafia in the number 19. He's currently in P4 of the GTP and uh, we're going to ride on board with him. So turn your sounds up. Enjoy these hybrid sounds as we ride on board the Porsche 963. Give us five minutes or so and we'll be right back with you here on RCI TV.
Final 48 and a half minutes of RCI's IMSA race here at Sebring. Two hours and 40 minutes was the scheduled time distance, and we have run the absolute gambit for weather and strategy, and we still haven't seen the end of it yet. 48 minutes left to go. Sindelar has given up the lead to Holland in the 58 Cadillac to some 20 seconds out in front after the most recent stop. Macha has retaken the lead in the LMP2 category, and Dolzal has done nothing but dominate in GTD. Hello again, I'm Jesse Lee, joined by John Dalton and Ash Bibby again for the final few moments of this race. Two hours and 40 minutes, we only have about 40 some left. A race like this is kind of an endurance race, Sean, but in today's race, because the the action, the drama has been coming fast and heavy since the drop of the green flag. It's felt like no time at all. Yeah, it has really flown past today, Jesse. And of course, welcome back to uh, everybody to the broadcast. Uh, but yeah, time is, you know, it's really flown. It hasn't felt like two hours has passed already. Obviously, we've uh, already done the uh, we've already done the qualifying uh, briefly as well. Uh, so we've actually been pretty good live for nearly, nearly three hours. But it certainly doesn't feel like three hours. Time has really flown. And of course, it's been a very action-packed race so far. Again, lots of calamity for drivers up and down the field. Lots of toes. Uh, lots of, uh, you know issues for uh, people and just being told in our youtube chat jesse uh, herford smith has had to uh, tow as well and uh, there's no mistake apparently from somebody else his wheelbase has frozen so 
I'm going to be trying to uh, probably restart his wheelbase, uh, try and get himself uh, back into the race. Apparently, the wheel went full left with full brakes and full throttle out of nowhere. So again, almost akin to a uh, mechanical failure. You could kind of put it upon the car. And uh, just being told as well, Les Stevenson has DNF. So lots of drama still with just over 46 minutes to go on the clock. Yeah, that's a absolutely uh, frustrating run for Hereford Smith, who is on for potentially a P3 finish here today in GTP. That would have been a heck of a finish from them, but it's all gone a little bit by the wayside. Daly back up into P4. They were pitting just as we came back to live. And Theobald Roskim, who has been quite quiet after a earlier smack in the wall that removed the entire the entire front of that Ferrari they had a quiet day up until this point where they just looped it in turn 16 and uh, no harm or foul there but they have decided to pit that automobile and they put on a fresh set of slick tires you can still see the you'll see the water off the back of the cars the rooster tails they're not nearly as big as they were but they're still present so you got to be careful with your dry tires only about uh, actually yeah it was only one car i've just realized that is still on a wet tire and that is the number 47 dollar of young everybody else has abandoned that strategy that's still racing anyway and they are on the dry tire so interesting strategy out of young the fifth place car as they are pictured here the all white delara i'm quite curious what that strategy is for not taking the dry i wonder if they're trying to gut this out to the finish but 45 minutes John that is a long old way yeah it's a long old way on a on a set of old tires especially uh, with the uh, punishment that they've already been through in the previous stint so you're essentially uh, double stinting a set of wets on a, an already drying track so it's going to be a very big ask from uh, Young on this uh, this stint I mean he's still lapping at a relatively competitive time of 1 minute 55.7 I mean Engman ahead is a 155.6 and he equally is on dry tyres and of course the uh, leaders of LMP2 149.150 ish on their times as we see uh, Bullwinkle and Bryant getting very close down down into turns uh, turn 10 uh, that was I almost thought it was turn 7 by the angle but no turn 10 as the uh, switchback chicanes begin afterwards and uh, Bullwinkle certainly looking the uh, faster of the two if you can compare previous lap times 205.5 for uh, Tom Bryant and 204.7 for Bullwinkle and of course the uh, guys ahead in the 203s 202s I mean Dolazal has uh, has lapped slightly in the last lap, 204.6, so maybe a little bit of traffic to uh, contend with, have to back out of a few corners, but certainly Bullwinkle looking the uh, quicker of the two here, and of course BMW on BMW action, it's all about where you can find that ever so slight advantage uh, between the two, but again Jesse, there's nobody really close to this duo in GTD, I mean Tom Bryant is a minute 15 behind Pillbeam ahead, and uh, Zanton behind is a minute 41. So these guys could essentially battle until their heart's content, and they still will probably come out very close to each other and not losing any position to, to either end of the field. This is smart driving by Bullwinkle right there to not take uh, too much of the inside curb. Could have caused an incident, got them both involved, Bryant as well. And instead of doing that, just decides to absolutely lock the car up. Of course, didn't lock the car up because it has ABS, but you take my meaning, just anything to stop it as Piotr Dominicus out of P2 in this class has just had a massive accident that has required them to tow back to the pit lane. So let's see what's happened to the number six Lamborghini. Oh, and it's a huge off, and I'm going to assume a swift crack into the wall, nearly flipping over but landing back on their wheels, the very pink Lamborghini has pitted out of P2. They've towed as well, so that will further drop them down the field. Alex Pillbeam has gone to P2 in the HWT BMW. That's the 242. The second of the HWT cars, the 244 Tom Bryant in fourth right now. Bialter is going to be in the pit lane for a long old time. More than a minute, I'd say. That's probably going to promote Bryant and Bullwinkle up a spot. So Tom Bryant is going to be up into third. It could be a double podium for HWT, but not if Bullwinkle has anything to say about it. Yeah, Bullwinkle's the uh, the next nearest one, isn't he, to, uh, to of course, uh, Tom Bryant. But even he's dropped off the, uh, the back ever so slightly. I'm not sure where 
uh, ball wing. Uh, no, sorry, we're watching Pillbeam here. I thought we were still watching Tom Bryant. Sorry, I was going to say uh, still very close to each other. Bryant and Bullwinkle, 0.4 uh, of a second, 0.5 of a second between them. So again, a very small mistake from either driver would see them switch positions. Erkma there just uh, getting through uh, Pillbeam for some uh, lap traffic and towards the uh, front of course Holland in the 58 Cadillac round Sunset Bend looking very composed indeed although Cinderlar behind the 145.4 fastest lap of the race so far from Cinderlar so that Acura just behind in P2 26 seconds to the good so Holland's got a good healthy lead at the moment but again Jesse anything can happen in endurance racing and we know that all too well indeed but fantastic scenes so far from Holland managed to keep the Cadillac under control I mean it had a few mistakes in the race as well so again not a perfect race from anyone on the field today but dollars are coming around the last corner dominicus of course towed back to the pit lane we've got a few race replays oh, coming no. up this time let's have a look xantum uh this is down into turn 10 uh, i believe yep turn 10 what? spin off oh. the drivers right that's a oh. heavy lick in to the right hand side concrete wall and uh, again the standing water on turn 10 just catching people out uh, this time tom bryant and, and Bull Bull down into turn one that's a very obscure angle to be coming at turn one and the hwt car backed into the tire wall very unfortunate there for tom bryant in the number 244 but not sure how that all kicked off prior, but coming in at such a shallow angle, Jesse, that was a very weird incident indeed. I'm still trying to process what happened to the car prior. I'm not entirely sure uh, if they dipped a tire off or, or not, but uh, going to the Volwinkle Bryant incident, uh, that was just unnecessary. That didn't need to happen, and that ruined a fantastic fight that could have went down to the very last of the race. Huge damage to Tom Bryant's car. They're going to drive that car back to the pit lane. And unfortunately, that is going to be a significant repair, many minutes worth of repair, I'd probably say. And that will dash HWT's double podium chances here. But Alex Pilbeam still in P2. And they are 45 seconds off. And uh, we'll see if uh, they're able to maybe claw some of that back. You never know. Dills all has been anything but impeccable here today, but still it would only take one good knock to change this entirely. Joe Dauber was in the chat earlier and uh, they were referencing a incident that happened with Theobald Roscom earlier on. You'll recall the car didn't hit the wall, but it slid off the racetrack, did a pirouette, but because it was off of the racetrack that counted as an off track that gave them 18 incident points 17 is the limit for the race, and that gave them a penalty. So that's the first that we know of today of going over the incident reports. America's off the track. Erford Smith will do the slide and do the time and get back in the fray. Tom Bryant trying to limp that damaged BMW home. It's going to damage it a little bit more hard impact driver side and... I was going to say they would have towed, but they haven't done. He's trying to get that car going the right way, but the tow link in the front of that car is completely busted. So the car's not steering appropriately. GT cars don't have the best steering at the best of instances. Now, this is dangerous. A car completely facing the wrong direction in a high-speed, unsighted corner. Right, continuing to back up, advances further off of the racing line than crosses the racetrack to pit lane. That was a very, very dangerous affair, but was able to get it done without any sort of incident. You know, John, I'm quite curious. Joe Dauber, thank you, by the way, Joe, for reporting in that they went over the incident limit. I can't imagine they're the only ones that are close. Yeah, I imagine a lot of drivers are going to be very close indeed. And as we see here on your screens, uh, Ash Bibby there bringing up the, uh, the incident reports. I believe it's the uh, far right-hand number we need to be looking at here. Uh, of course, 17 was the limit for a penalty, and then you need eight successive uh, penalties again to get the next penalty. So essentially, you need 25 before you net your next penalty. Everybody in the mid to high teens, I mean, looking down, uh, Erkma on 36, that's got to be an all-time high score uh, right there, Jesse. But yeah, certainly lots of drivers, you know, on the uh, incident points again anybody with low numbers has retired i mean you look at Hymo, of course that was tarts being a hacker uh, they've only got eight to their name but uh, out of the cars that are going 
I think the Muppet Brothers with Ashley Holland, of course, uh, your race leader, I believe, on 11. So he's got a little bit of headway still to play with. But yeah, very, very uh, interesting to have a look at who is on what incident points. Again, something we don't get in ACC. It's a, it's a very speculative thing uh, from up in the broadcasting booth. You just kind of have to take educated guesses on who has uh, enough penalties to themselves. We've got another race replay here of the American car of Hereford Smith through turn 16. He goes and just looping it in front of the GTD uh, race leader. That's uh, very well kind of controlled, should we say, to finish up on the grass and manages to uh, get going again. Uh, just looking to the YouTube chat again, you mentioned obviously Joe Dorber. We've had uh, Frederick Gutman, who you may remember for our fantastic uh, ACC highlight reels that we had through the uh, World Tour last season. Welcome on in, uh, Frederick. Uh, Newsor is, in fact, uh, Dominicus. Uh, so he's commented on the repairs from that incident we saw with the Lamborghini going into the wall, nearly flipping. Uh, seven minutes of repairs required and an optional two minutes. So nearly, like, what's that going to be? Nearly a 10-minute pit stop by the time you've got in and out of the lane. That's a big chunk of time to lose, especially with, you know, about 40 minutes to go. You're not going to come out for the next 10 minutes. That leaves half an hour to undo all of the, uh, the misfortune that you've just had from that off. So uh, very sensibly, I think has uh, decided to retire the car or maybe just going to wait it out and come back and see if he can claw together some kind of finish at least uh, that doesn't of course uh, affect him too much. Uh, Tom Bryant commenting just now, well that was going far too well for too long clearly and after the incident in turn one and turn 17, 14 minutes of repairs so doubling uh, Peter Dominicus's uh, repairs and four minutes of optional so that's uh, nearly 20 minutes in the pit lane and again with 35 40 minutes to go that's not going to leave you a lot of time to get out of the pits and undo that so uh, yeah very unfortunate for Tom Bryan it was going all too well for far too long I think is uh, what we uh, managed to get from that on the broadcast Jesse yeah, well, one thing that you can always count on in sim racing is if it's going too well, that's a bit suspicious. Something is obviously going to happen. The penny's going to fall with a very resounding thud. And uh, unfortunately for HWT, at least one half of the team, it did right there. Tom Bryant, by the way, owned up to that incident, told us in confidence that, yep, just uh, went down the inside, should have braked earlier, went right into the path of the other car and got spun off the nose, uh, taking the responsibility for that one, you, you commented on that, John, yourself, that that was a, a strange angle to go into that corner, led to the contact. Something else I want to bring up, Sharslav Sindelar, back in the 191, the pit stop sequence, the cycle that went on while we were at break, they obviously have not retained the lead. We documented that Holland in the 58 Cadillac is the leader of the race. A few laps ago, Sindelar set the quickest lap of the race. It's a mid-45. Holland has somewhat responded. Sindelar hasn't been able to get too close. The Drift King Motorsports 191 still sitting there in P2 for the time being. I would say, on average, this Acura is quicker than the leading Cadillac right now, but the question is, is 33 minutes long enough to make up that time? One lap, I will say, Holland in, is a little bit quicker, and the next lap, Sindelar will get that back, so it sort of stagnates. But the quickest lap of the race right now so far, a few laps ago by Sindelar, so that car has the pace. The question is, do they have the consistency to run down those now 10 seconds and take back this lead one more time and get the win? Yeah, I mean, the uh, the lap times are coming down very quickly indeed. I mean, looking at the gap, it's already come down two seconds in one sector for Sindelar to Holland there, and it's falling ever so much as well. So eight seconds to the good now on the accurate to the Cadillac and being displayed on your screens at the moment is the best lap time for the cars shown. So 145.7 for Holland is the quickest lap they've run. Sindelar's team a 145.4, so much, much quicker on that overall pace. I mean, looking towards uh, LMP2, Bart Matcher, 148.7. He's the fastest car in that category. Uh, all bar, of course, Campregna, who managed a 148.6 at some point during the race. And towards the uh, GTD category, of course, Dolazal, very closely contended with Pilbeam on their overall fastest lap time as well. So uh, looking very competitive up and down the field, but 
I think Cinderlar might just have enough in that Acura to find their way towards the uh, towards the front there. Jordan Daly dispatching of Dominicus. Great to see him back out, Jesse. After lengthy repairs, uh, Peter Tor Dominicus has found his way back to the circuit in the number six Iron Lynx Lamborghini. So uh, good to see him seeing out the uh, the rest of that one. Tom Bryant still in the pit lane, parked at the uh, jaunty angle on the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, so not too sure if he'll be coming back, but 20 minutes of repairs to do. So expect to see him back out with the 15 to 20 minutes to go mark if he does continue. Uh, he has also admitted, Jesse, you mentioned earlier on, uh, admitted to the incident with uh, the other BMW of, uh, who was it now, Bullwinkle, uh, into turn one. Uh, he's also apologised to uh, Vanstone for that one incident. If you remember, the Ferrari got turned in at turn one into the, uh, the tyre wall on the outside, had to tow. Uh, he said he wasn't expecting the Ferrari to break anywhere near that early. Did wait for the position to return, but then noticed, of course, Vanstone towed back to the pit lane as we see a, an off-road excursion in the background there. I think that was um, Campregna in the uh, number 46, just running a little bit wide, and it was indeed. Comes through turn one, looks all calm and together, and just runs a little bit wide through the grass and a little bit of the sand and remains back on circuit. Manages to get it pulled up for turn three as well. So uh, no harm, no foul, but... It is going to be another penalty point towards the number 46 as total so far for this race, Jesse. Sure is. Dwarf and Chan asks a very interesting question at this junction in the race. Uh, is fuel going to be an issue? Essentially, will they have to make an extra stop? Now, that is an interesting question because some of the GTPs, at least according to my math, will have to do or should have to do, unless they're on a very, very high fuel-saving map, they may have to come in and do a splash and dash. I think every other category, based on when the rain let up, based on when they went to dry tires, they will be okay. I've seen a couple of cars come in uh, somewhat recently, and I don't think they'll have to come in at all. Young, by the way, in the 47 in the LMP2 class, I think they're gonna be just fine. I think most of the GTDs, if not all the GTDs currently running, are gonna be fine as they go long on fuel anyway. They can stretch it quite nicely. The GTPs, though, that's the strange one for me. I think a couple of the cars are going to be quite a bit short. I know Erkma is going to be short on fuel. They'll need to come in again. They'll be the first ones. They'll be our indication if the others are going to have to and how long they may need to go. A couple of the ones that were in later might be at a little bit of an advantage. You've got Herford Smith who was in that somewhat later than everybody else, of course, having to do some repairs to that car. So um, a lot of the field, most of the field should be fine. GTPs, they will be our first indication that especially that triple three car will tell us how short they are on fuel. I reckon, according to my math, everybody else should be good to go. And if they're not, they definitely can use a fuel saving map to make it to the end. Yeah, I mean, uh, Jong, of course, riding on board with at the moment, last pitted on uh, lap 60. So he's the kind of last of the stoppers or the latest uh, of the pit stoppers, should we say. So he should be safe to uh, to go all the way to the end now, of course, especially if he's on fresher tyres. He's going to see the uh, checkered flag before. Imagine the uh, fuel runs out. is nearly running into the back there. I think that was Daly uh, up the inside in the Jota 963. It was indeed. Uh, Jordan Daly there through Sunset. Just popped the car up the inside. Yong maybe not paying attention and nearly got caught out by the uh, the much faster GTP. I think we've just seen uh, Dijkstra down the pit lane as well. The number 12 currently in P2. Uh, Erkma somewhere is round on the circuit displaying another yellow flag for them. Here's a race replay. This is uh, through the Le Mans section. Just hooked too much curb, Jesse. Once again, another pirouette for the Triple R and back face in the right way. Back underway once again, uh, Erkma. I wonder how many degrees the triple three has spun today. I don't know, but Irkma is several degrees of cool. I can tell you that off the top of my head. But uh, yeah, just it's one of those that you admire the gumption to keep going in a situation like this. It's super easy in sim racing to to take it a little bit too serious, in my opinion, and get very frustrated by stuff like that. But it's, it's way easier if you're calm, cool like Irkma is and just Keep going, run the race, run the laps. Maybe you learn something too about the car and it benefits you for uh, a little bit later on, a little bit later race. And you don't learn anything by giving up in a situation like this. So, but continuing to do it, making it look pretty and interesting as well. Only 
the one actual incident. Every other spin has been saved, which either tells me one thing, they did it enough in practice that they figured out how to save the car, or they're just really good at uh, car control in a spin. Either way, it's uh, kept them from a lot of extra repairs, though, of course, uh, several laps off of the overall pace, and thus far struggling with the handling of that particular GTP Porsche. Well, looking up front, at the very front, in fact, the overall lead for GTP, Holland has a eight and a half to nine second lead. It was about 10 and a half seconds. The gap at 33 minutes to go. It's 26, and they've gained quite a bit under eight seconds now. I reckon, John Dalton, that Sindelar will get there. The question will be not if he gets there, but will he have enough time to make the pass when he arrives? Yeah, that's going to be the other thing, isn't it? It's all very well catching the uh, car ahead of you, but do you have enough in you to pass the car once you get there? And I think it's going to be a uh, classic case of traffic giveth and traffic taketh away. I think that's going to be the uh, the key for Cinderlar to uh, get past Holland. If you know Holland stumbles or hesitates passing a GTD or an LMP car, that could be what Cinderlar needs to uh, fire that car towards the inside line, as we see there, Raffier getting past Compregna in the uh, the number 46. Uh, so Raffier currently P3 on the road in GTP. Again, another driver that's, that's made mistakes this race, Jesse. We've caught a few of them on the broadcast, but has made you know just enough corrections to uh, keep the car out of the wall and uh, pointing the right way uh, that he has managed to find his way onto the bottom step of the podium. Next up for him, the LMP2 driver of Mark Brown, currently in P8 overall and it looks a little bit chaotic ahead as we've got gtps we've got a gtd and an lmp all in the mix i think that's Erkma pillbeam uh, up there we've got the uh the sim brothers racing car that's eric engman uh, p3 overall in the lmp category as well so plenty of action going on towards turn 10 fires it to the inside raffier on pillbeam very good move there very forceful you've got to you've got to be committed to these moves haven't you jesse as soon as you see a gap you've got to go for it you've got to get that overlap pull the car alongside and pray that the other car has seen you do such so Obviously, they don't turn in and chop your nose off before it's too late. But you have to be forceful, but not overly forceful, and really pick those moments when you do want to make those passes. There's no built-in sort of thing for these iRacers for, you know, knowing if there's cars inside of you. Of course, for the AC games, we have a little heli Corsa thing, and for a lot of other games, they have something very similar, a positional indicator. Not really a thing that they have for this. There's external uh, sort of programs that you can use and a lot of drivers do. I was watching Ted Edwards with his uh, this past week and it's quite interesting to see his is more of like a line graph. It shows you how big the car is and where it is in relation to you. It doesn't bother with showing you a representation of the actual cars. It's literally just a line graph. And it, it looks it looks very interesting and there's other ones too that are closer to the heli course of thing that Assetto players will be aware of as well that you can get. That's the one I use, in fact. But uh, that's not a default thing. You can't rely on everybody to have that is kind of my point I'm getting to. And if you don't have the spotter turned up or turned on, then that also could be a problem. So you're at the mercy of other drivers out there. I always said and I always heard this in racing. Hey, you got to take care of each other out there. What is a, a race promoter? What does the safety instructor mean by that? That means don't do anything silly. Check your mirrors. Make sure 100% that you're clear on moves or that the other guy or girl or they know that you're there whenever you're going to make a move. So do, don't do anything silly. Take care of each other. Don't compromise each other. That's all well and good while you're sitting in the safety instruction meeting, John. But in the final 20 minutes of a race with a podium on the line, I don't think they remember the driver's briefing as much. Yeah, certainly the uh, the rules of the driver's briefing get kind of pushed to the back of the mind, don't they? When, you know, a true racing driver sees or smells victory and they can do, you know, a slightly more forceful overtake maybe to uh, make it happen. That's kind of all that's on their mind, you know, the glory of winning or the glory of gaining another position. Uh, last time by Cinderlar, you notice the uh, purple lap time towards the right-hand side of their timing Improved table. That's the fastest fastest lap of that car so far 145.4 and holland by a hundredth 
And <laughs> exactly. It sounds like the smallest of margins, but of course, if they're keeping that pace up consistently, they're going to be on the back of Holland before they know at 146.9. And you've got to remember, Jesse, we touched on this earlier. A lot of drivers electing to do this race solo, of course, Holland being one of those cars. And again, the Drift King Motorsports effort are a double team, of course, with uh, Sindelar and Mayer. So Sindelar is going to have started the race, had a little bit of a rest period in between before taking the car over for the latter half of the race. Meanwhile, Holland's going to be slogging two hours 40 out, looking at the clock, thinking, when is this going to end? The end cannot come soon enough for us. And I'm not sure if that's a timing glitch, but that gap has just shot back up to 15 seconds. Yes, it dropped back down indeed to seven seconds. You can't be too sure because, as we say, anything can happen here. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, sometimes the gap gets a little wonky for a lap or two. It's just the way that it works. It will eventually, when it decides to, correct itself. We are watching uh, Gordon there. We were. Uh, we haven't seen a whole lot of Gordon as of late. They were uh, lamenting earlier on about some of the issues of the car, and now they're back out there. They're still going. Uh, seventh place in their class daily there inside the top five. They were very briefly outside the top five earlier today and spent the early part of the race in fifth. They've done a little bit better than that. They're higher than they qualified, I do believe, in fourth place right now. Uh, absolutely not near anybody. In fact, I would say uh, third place, fourth place, and fifth place are on their own islands. They're almost on their own laps, in fact, as well. So talked about the fuel earlier on. If you're close on it, there's no reason in my mind, for Raffier, Daly, or Herford Smith to be doing anything but going max save here if they think they're anywhere near close because you don't want to come back into pit lane. Yeah, you have a minute and a half gap in some instances, but that's about the trip down pit lane, so you don't want to have to do that anyway and lose a spot late in a race like that, and that's certainly something you got to watch out for. Max Save, though, is what I would say. Uh, the gap up in front, absolutely going crazy. It's up to two and a half minutes now. It was down to zero seconds. Who really knows what's going on there as Dijkstra, who uh, led the race in the middle portion, has now had a little bit of an incident, lost a few seconds. Bart Macha has taken complete control of the LMP2 field. Look for a minute that... They may be challenged with the strategy, but no, it hasn't happened that way. Machet re-establishing control of LMP2. Yeah, riding aboard here with uh, De Jong as he uh, comes through the uh, latter half of the lap, of course, right behind Ted Edwards in the LMP2 category. It's not for a podium. It is only for P5, of course, overall. But again, every position matters. And being told in our ears, something has happened to Holland in the number 58 he's pitted actually being told uh, next to his uh, lap time of course you see the uh, the little couldn't pit symbol it. so go on jesse i'm just saying couldn't make it yeah obviously couldn't make it to the end Cinderella, uh still out at the moment last pitted lap 52 so again could we be seeing a splash and dash yet from Cinderella? again it's going to be one of those mind game things isn't it holland's not going to know the strategy of Cinderella. can Cinderella get to the end or will they come down pit lane as well so holland now has to uh, weigh up risk versus reward does he push the car all the way to the end or does he take a more conservative route just fend off raffier he's, you know, he's not he's, he's not conservative right time. now he's he's continuing to reset fast lap that was another two 100s better Sindelar's not on a safety fuel map he's going for it so either that means one of two things john he knows he has the fuel to go to the end or he knows he has to come down pit lane regardless Oh, I don't know which one it is, though. Yeah, we're going to have to pay close attention, aren't we, to the uh, to the GTPs. Uh, Daly has been in the pit lane. He's now on his outlap as well as Holland uh, at the same time. So we should see Daly and Holland, in theory, go all the way to the end. But I don't think Cinderella's is going to have enough in the tank. We've got another race replay here of uh, Erkma. Is this going to be another pirouette, Jesse? Yes, it kind of is. A little 45-degree half spin uh, before managing to uh, lock it all the way back to the right and get back onto the circuit once again. So plus 45 degrees on to the rotational of that car if you're counting at home. Uh, meanwhile, Harvey coming up here on some slower oh, traffic. Just, just got a little line. bit too wide offline. Caught the, caught the marbles probably the uh, slightly greasier end of the line and uh, unfortunately found their way around and back to live pitch as we go but kudos to the uh, number 13 jesse they've really been in the wars lately the majority of it down at turn seven of course when the heavens open but 
persistence, they are still going and they are going to see the checker flag. Fingers crossed here, but, you know, always admire a team that, that doesn't stop no matter what. I respect drivers and teams that know they have to throw in the towel. You got to know when to when to cut your losses, but you got to love a team who just refuses to uh, to stay down. That just look, the racetrack's paid for the series is running. Why not uh, use the track time? The track's there. It's free real estate. And uh, you got to respect a team who just wants to race. It's not about where they finish in the end. It's the taking part. And as cheesy as that probably sounds to 90% of the audience, honestly, be, being there taking part is really the big battle and saying that, yeah, we got to the finish of the race and it may have not been pretty, but we were there. And uh, sometimes for a lot of these teams, that's what's important. It's just the being involved with it and uh, enjoying your time on the racetrack and uh, racing around with others. Uh, the Chaos 2 helps. It's always fun when there's a little extra mix of weather in there as well. They definitely got that today. And uh, Sindelar continues to reset quick lap. That time he did it by an entire 10. 45-3-4-1, the quickest overall lap. And Obviously, the quickest lap in GTP. Mark Macha set the quickest lap in LMP2, a 48.4. And while that's impressive, that tells me well, the track's pretty good. Uh, the track condition's pretty good. And also, those two cars not saving, not even attempting to save fuel here. Yeah, everybody really kind of going at it, aren't they, to try and get themselves as far forward as they can go. Bart Matcher again with the fastest time for himself last time by, a personal best from uh, Dijkstra last time by for them in the number 12, just behind as uh, Bart comes to the line this time by. And it's a 151.1, so a big chunk of time lost there for the number five. So the number 12 is going to have to really try and capitalize as Erkmer comes out the pits side by side with Macho. They go through turn two of the kink on the brakes for turn three and uh, everything sorts itself out by the time they do reach that. The Connection Lost Racing car there looking very well indeed and continuing to dominate, as you said earlier on, Jesse. Bart seems relatively unfazed no matter the weather conditions and what is thrown at them. So uh, yeah, kudos to Bart for keeping it on the straight and narrow although can Dijkstra do anything it's going to be a kind of what if with uh, the PCDC motorsports car what if they hadn't had the spin at the first lap could this had been another fight that we're seeing of course with Sindelar and Holland where they're so close together we think one of them could pass the other and you know it's very unfortunate indeed but you know you win some you lose some Jesse you certainly do Dijkstra has not laid down by any stretch of the imagination a 48-192 that time through for the number 12, Delara, and that's the quickest lap time. So still giving Macha something to think about. 20 seconds behind is Dijkstra, but uh, still trying their best. Also a car not saving. Talked about earlier the strategy, the pitch strategy. Some cars probably couldn't make it. I think we've seen some of them come in. I thought the majority of the field probably could, especially if they saved early enough, they could get there. I certainly feel like there are a couple of cars that are absolutely on max save. Uh, one car that probably isn't, though, is Carlson. That's the fourth place car in LMP2. They came in somewhat recently, lap 71, and they did a somewhat quick pit stop. That tells me that that was their strategy to take a little splash in dash and get back out there in the fray. Now, again, the real big question is, as Raffier has come into pit lane and exited out of third place in GTP is how many more cars are going to have to do something similar to these late race splash and dashes. The closer you get to the finish without running out of fuel, that just means the pit stop is shorter. The least amount of fuel necessary is beneficial here if you have to take any at all. Of course, uh, saving on the racetrack might end up saving you an entire trip down pit lane. We're still talking about a minute on pit lane minimum, realistically, without a, a real tire stop. So it's still a minute lost if you got to come down for that splash. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the least amount of time you're spent on pit lane in endurance racing, the better. And it's all about, you know, continuously circulating around, nailing in those laps. And, of course, the uh, fastest distance 
does equal the winner at the end. Race replay here of Cinderella squeezing to the inside there of Ross Cam. I don't think there was contact visually, uh, but again, we know iRacing netcode can be a little bit troublesome at times. Whether or not Ross Cam was just a little bit spooked by suddenly seeing a GTP down the inside, time will tell. Uh, turn 10 for Brown down the uh, the next escape road he's going to explore. Uh, back on to the circuit he will come, so a minor lockup. I can only assume there, lifted off the pedal, managed to get the wheel grip back again and uh, found his way on to the circuit. So all good for Brown in the number 99. Eric Engman in the chat from the, uh, the Sim Brothers Racing entry saying, uh, good test for this 12 hour. Thanks for organizing. Uh, you're very much welcome. And if you do want to get involved, of course, with us here at RCI and maybe find your way to a broadcast, we have plenty of events over on the website at the moment. That's racerci.com. You can find a link down below in the description. Predominantly uh, Assetto Corsa Competizione. However, there are a few iRacing, you know, one iRacing event, should I say, uh, on the website still. That's the uh, IMSA uh, series that we've been running on Thursdays. But the majority is, of course, for ACC. And of course, tonight we do have uh, Night Owl coming Did back. Right. So, uh, of course, join us later on today on RCI TV when you catch Jesse Lee uh, taking you through Night Owl season 17. Are you We're continuing. Me? at Paul Ricard for round three. Uh, Timothy Flamga seems to be a relevant name in Night Owl. He's currently leading Raphael Huell and Lewis Zelch for pro and uh, Sandro Simo's leading Les Stevenson from Callum Kerrigan in silver. So championship still very much alive there. What series uh, is that, Joe? That's uh, Saturday Night Owl season 17, Jesse. <laughs> as we have Ash Bibby shouting in our ears about that one. Uh, next week on Monday continues the uh, Monday Multiclass Madness theme with uh, GT4 and TCX. Last week we saw, of course, John Eraser beating Azurko and Grim Lilith uh, in GT4. And, of course, Raphael Huell, Victor Nordquist and Nico Kumpu took the honours in TCX. Uh, Midweek Masters has been postponed for a week to allow for some more sign up So if you are interested in that one, then grab yourself a duo and get signed up. I believe the uh, sign-ups may be opening to solo drivers if it hasn't, of course, already happened. A big kick-up of standing water there from uh, Herford Smith into the face of Daly as these guys get very close on circuit. Uh, Thursday, we're back at Sebring for the iRacing IMSA final. And Friday, we'll begin our brand new KTM Master Series in ACC. GT2 or GT4, take your pick. As Daly gets run up to the concrete wall there by Herford Smith, trying to cut off the Porsche driver as they come out of turn 16. Daly's had to back out and drop in behind again as Daly oh, shoots to the inside go. in Sunset. Very committed. Can Herford Smith find the grip for the old Absolutely up and under? He can't. Not. The 963 has superb drive off the corner. Jordan Daly up into P4. Herford Smith down into P5. But as I was saying, the KTM Masters kicking off Friday. Uh, we're heading to Brands Hatch for round one. GT2 or GT4, pick your poison on that one. And then next Saturday, it's another double header, this time in the form of the World Tour 2024. That's beginning at the Nürburgring GP. Pre-qualifying still going on for this one. So again, if you do want a late entry, a late sign up, get yourself involved in that one. And then Saturday next week, of course, Night Owl round four heads to Indianapolis as uh, Kevin Boss celebrates the KTM Masters. Uh, that's his cooking up. So if you do want to show your support for Kevin Boss as an event admin, and as well as Ash Bibby, I'm being at home in my ear, uh, then of course, get your name down for that one and show your support. And uh, meanwhile, back to today's action at Sebring, a very eagle-eyed viewer, Dwarf Guy 66 has noticed Cinderlar has come down the pit lane. He's currently on the outlap for the number 191. And I don't think Holland has got enough, Jesse. I think Sindelar has got the overcut on the number 58. Certainly has. Sindelar had the quicker stop in the Acura and is back out there. That was likely the strategy all along, but the gap is not particularly big. You can see that red and black Cadillac, that's Holland, right on the tail of Sindelar here late in the race. Less than 10 minutes left to go, and it's this close between the top two in the race. And if you don't watch IMSA racing, let me tell you, not a sponsor of this broadcast, this is par for the course for any time IMSA hits the track. And uh, this is the kind of stuff that we get treated to year round. So if you don't watch IMSA sports car racing, do it, just do it. It, it finishes like this. They, they sort of fan out during the race. They all come back together at the end. They have a right good scrap. And of course, that includes last year's 12-hour Sebring, which of course is fast approaching 420. 
2024 as well. The top two going to fight it out amongst themselves. The question is, does Holland's Cadillac have anything for the Acura of Sindelar? And does Young have any grip left in that car? A couple of hair-raising corners, and they get the car back in control as they exit the Collier section of the racetrack. Yeah, Young, of course, back onto the uh, dry tires after earlier. We uh, saw them on the wets trying to uh, eke them out for as long as possible. Last time by was a personal best for the number 47, although getting all crossed up in turn seven and eight isn't going to be good for his progression on to the back of Ted Edwards. Meanwhile, uh, we've got Dominicus on circuit. He's still circulating around after his lengthy 10-minute repairs. Of course, the personal best for him last time by a 201.8. But again, what could have been for the Lamborghini driver looking so strong in the early stages. And I've just noticed that Tom Bryan is also back out on circuit. We did speculate whether or not he'd come back after his 20-minute repairs as Carlson overcooks turn seven and allows uh, that's Erkma through and of course the uh, GTDs uh, back through as well that's Bullwinkle and Zanton uh, that's not Carlson sorry that's uh, somebody else maybe Cam Pregna was that well Camferger's up to P2 right now I don't know if it would have been them but Bart Macha Camferger and Dijkstra your top three in LMP2 after the late pit stops and the cycle around a couple of cars haven't come in Young uh, came in on lap 60, of course, but they're one of the latest pitters. Camferger hasn't come in since lap 63. Those are cars that are absolutely pushing it. Jordan Daly into the pit lane, pitting out of fourth place. That should surrender that spot to Herford Smith and put Daly back down to fifth. Sindelar, Holland, and Rafi are your top three. You're likely top three finishers. What way around they'll finish? That's still up for debate here with five and a half minutes, though Sindelar has made a little bit of a gap for themselves, though, as I've said that, that time around, it was Holland's Cadillac that was the quickest car around. Holland setting the quickest personal lap that they've done all day. It's a personal best for the number 58, Daly, who come in for a very quick splash and go, and they have somehow, at least according to our live timing, they have retained P4. That was a 30 or some second gap. It's now down under 10, but Daly has somehow been able to keep P4. Yeah, Daly clawing on to P4, just outside of podium position for the uh, number 14 there. Got a good gap to Herford Smith. So in theory, if uh, Herford Smith has to come down the lane, that's gonna elongate that gap even more. So a fantastic pass from Daly into Sunset Bend. Uh, netted him, of course, uh, P4 uh, overall on that one. Meanwhile, Holland still trying to get onto the back of Sindelar. La last time by, it was nearly a second loss between the two. It was Sindelar with a 146 flat almost, and Holland nearly into the 147s. So again, the uh, Cadillac there very much struggling to match the pace of the Acura, although never say never, Jesse Lee. Traffic giveth and traffic taketh away. Just over four minutes to go. There's a couple of uh, a couple of cars on the circuit ahead. So GTD and uh, possibly some more as we uh, flick to a race replay here of Harby. Coming down into turn seven again, Jesse Lee. It's almost like Groundhog Day for this team once again. Looping it round this time on the exit. Across the grass they will go. Uh, probably onto the escape road indeed. And then back out through the cones onto the circuit and between the two GTDs. But again, it's going to feel like Groundhog Day for those guys. We've seen that all too much. But not sure. Has has Holland got enough in the tank for Cinderella? Meanwhile, we've got Ted Edwards. Uh, this is behind the rebound racing car. And Ted loops it in front of Yong. And Yong nearly does the same on the exit trying to check up. But I think Yong just managed to hold on. I'm sure we're going to see a race replay in a minute from him. A uh, Ross Cam coming down into turn seven. Turns in. A little bit of understeer. A little bit of oversteer. And Yong again has to avoid another car this time with um, Brown just behind him as well. There goes Ted Edwards through. We've got Erkma. Let's see how many degrees we're going to have to add on to the spin total today. No! That's going to be that's going to be 180. 180 degrees on to that one as uh, Erkma goes round into the wall. And uh, yeah, whoever's keeping tally of that car, I would love to know how many degrees in total uh, we have spun so far in the race for the Triple R car. Uh, but yeah, certainly continuing on. And another big one through Sunset, grazing the wall in the Forza Horizon now, series. That will be known as a drift purpose. tap. That does look yeah. slightly on purpose, but a drift tap nonetheless from the uh, Triple Three there onto the wall. And 
Probably going to be uh, some damage on the rear end of that triple three. But uh, yeah, Erkma still going on as such. And, you know, like we say, Jesse, another car that's been in the wars but has continued to keep going and, you know, just having some fun, I guess, at this point. And that's, of course, what it's all about. Here's Harvey again. Is going to have another little spin here, I imagine. This time it's on the curb. Luckily, to the uh, elongated concrete runoffs there. Folks, just before we get to the end of this race, just want to thank all of you for being with us here on a Saturday afternoon, evening, or morning, depending on where you are in the world. We appreciate the heck out of you being with us. We hope that you've enjoyed today's broadcast. We only ask that on your way out today, if you wouldn't mind liking and subscribing to the channel, more racing this evening, Night Owl Season 17 continues. We'll be back with you on Monday for more GT4 and Touring Car Multi-Class Racing. More iRacing on Thursday, the conclusion of the IMSA Road Season 1 Championship right from right here at Sebring. We're going to do it again in about a week's time as well. And Friday, Champ, the KTM Multi-Class Series starts next Friday. All of that and more here live on RCI TV. WRC group available as well with rallies going on. And uh, for more, all you got to do, join the Discord. Go to racerci.com. Check us out. And don't forget to subscribe to RCI TV for more great racing action. Thank you all for being with us. I hope that you've enjoyed this race as much as we have bringing it to you. And John, as we get close to the end of this one, what a race it has been for Sindelar, Holland, Macha, and Dolzal all day long. It was somewhat in doubt in all categories today, but the cream always rises to the top. And uh, what an exciting way to do it here. Yeah, absolutely fantastic race we've had here today at Sebring as we catch another race replay of Hereford Smith out of I'm turn 16 saluting. again. Another slightly lazy slide for the uh, the, for the tail finned uh, United States of America flag car as uh, he navigates, of course, back to the It's facing the right now. way as it's well. It's all good. I'm very proud but, yeah. of is it facing the right way on both sides? I guess it is. Uh, yeah, it sure is. Some of the cars coming across the line right now, getting the checkered flag or at least i think that was the checkered flag i'm sure i saw a checkered but the clock it, it, has only just hit zero yeah i was gonna say it definitely looked like the checkered but i doubt it is here is jaroslav sindelar in the acura coming to the line what a race it was for them they had to use some strategy today they had the pace and in the end they've won the race congratulations to both of the drivers on that team they absolutely deserve it. The lone Cadillac gets it done here at Sebring. Yeah, fantastic race from the uh, Drift King Motorsport duo, of course, of Yaroslav Sindelar and Patrick Meyer. Again, was looking a little bit doubtful in the beginning with an earlier mistake, of course, getting caught up in some action down at turn 10. Uh, but meanwhile, this man here, Bart Matcher, has driven faultlessly all race for the Connection Loss Racing number five. He will come through to the line to be your victory in LMP2 in the Dallara there. 148.2. No, sorry, it was caught up. Thought he was going to finish on an all-time personal best there, but uh, Timing Tower caught me out. And this man here, Dolazal, again, on his last tour of the circuit the uh, Porsche 992 drivers had a fantastic race again just look at those last lap times Jesse Lee 202.3 205.5 he has been the man to try and beat and a fantastic drive from the number 91 nonetheless a little bit more lap traffic to contend with of course uh, Raffier there in the background he thinks twice about making a late dive into turn 16 there's no point the checker flag is out of course Holland has already finished so Raffier will gain nothing from passing dollars out in a hurry and potentially ruin two people's races coming down into the sunset bend is your gtd leader for the last time of course down the lane lap 47 last time by so the fueling in these gtds is fantastic again been able to go all the way to the end from the last stop heavens have opened times have been very testing indeed but dollars out will come through to take the victory in gtd and very honorly and as well, should we say, as he pulls immediately off to drive to the left to uh, get back to the pit lane. A great solo effort and finish on a personal best lap time, Jesse, a two minute point seven overall. So fantastic stuff from the GTD driver.
Brilliant stuff from the JS Hot Lappers, number 91 Porsche, a win for the Czech faithful as well. And that concludes an excellent afternoon of racing here. Weather played a huge factor in the strategy. And when it went haywire, the teams at the top found a way to rebound and make it happen. A close battle there in the end for the overall victory as well. Does all, I think of all of the drivers, just cruise to victory and just an exclamation point on the day by setting the quickest lap in class at the very end there. So many things to go over from today's race. So many things we could talk about. We'll talk about the, first of all, the weather change in iRacing. I think it's absolutely brilliant. The weather system works as it should. The wind and the rain and all of that obviously adds a lot to the simulator but on top of that we saw a decent mix of strategy some cars they came in a little bit too early they paid the price some in came a little bit too late and lost time out there on the racetrack but all in all a really good race i think more than anything a lot of these drivers we'll see them back for the imsa finale on thursday i think they learned a lot here today that they could apply in that finale on thursday yeah, I think this was like a little bit of a, a test event for a lot of people, wasn't it? As we see uh, Tom Bryant there, the 244, celebrating with some donuts on the uh, start-finish straight after his major accident. Back in the race he got, and he also managed to take the checkered flag. But a lot of drivers, like you say, Jesse, are probably going to take this as a, an extended test session, maybe for next Thursday. Again, Eric Engman for the uh, Sim Brothers Racing saying thank you for, of course, organizing this. It's been a great practice run to the 12 hours as well. So a lot of drivers probably learn lots about the car and the new weather system as you said in iRacing only coming just last week so it's uh it's a big learning curve to learn something and again like we said a lot of sim racers love to see something shiny and go oh let's play with this for uh, a considerable amount of time and of course tom bryant has done the same with the weather file here and fantastic no doubt good mix of strategy and it really threw a curveball in the mix and it it wasn't just you know one driver or one team constantly slipping up every single driver i think in this race jesse had a mistake to their name and it wasn't flawless from anyone at all in the grid today one thing that you don't ever count on when you come to this race track at sebring is that you're gonna have a perfect race in fact most endurance racing you don't think that in a sprint race yeah you want to keep it you're going to keep it absolutely immaculate but that's not really the case it's all about your plan for your plan for your plan a never works out so you go to b c d e f g and uh, if you're me you end up on a z at some point but the point i'm making is that it's how you respond to adversity not how you get in adversity that matters in races like today and speaking of which let's talk to mr uh, adversity here today. Beatr Dominicus, you were on the podium at certain points of the day. You fought back. You were in the wall. Weather came in. Walk us through your day. Uh, I came in with no expectations, uh, really. Um, so even qualifying second, I think. Uh, kind of out of the blue. But it just, just confirms that I like this track and the pace is there. Um... For the race itself, it was more of a practice session for Thursday, in my opinion. So in that sense, it actually went great. Um, a bit of uh, bump, bumpy uh, racing at the start, that's fine. Climb my way back up into second. Uh, rain hit, bit of a struggle, but... Uh, Got some sense into the car, how to brake. Uh, it's a bit difficult with also traffic. Uh, also negotiating you, but I had a little touch with from that in the rain. Apart from that, traffic was fine. Uh, slowly worked my way forward, uh, contoured into the dry tires. And you probably saw it on stream what happened. Turned well, into the be... left and right as I get onto a wet patch, I hit the brakes and yeah, that's it. <laughs> Ash Bibby's our broadcaster. He doesn't miss anything. So uh, yeah, we absolutely uh, saw that. So, I gotta say, from a GT3 or a GTD standpoint, how bumpy is the racetrack for you? The prototypes are getting bounced around, but is it a little better in a GTD, do you think? 
I barely notice it. <laughs> it's a bit worse in the in the wet, I would say. A few parts is it. Tires just go when you try to go on throttle, but mostly, mostly fine actually. It's, it's more the like the rubber thin track with the wet combination that catches you out and not really the bumpiness. Well, there you have it, Piotr. Is there anybody you want to shout out, say hello to? For this time round, Kevin, he was really struggling with the bump, bumpy part of the track. I think he was the only BMW prototype. Yeah, he, he didn't keep it together in the race. There was some swear words in the voice chat. Completely understandable. There were, some, there were some redacted swear words in the chat as well. So yeah, that, yeah, that tracks. Yeah. So uh, he, he kept true for quite a long time, but uh, and, uh, he thought uh, the better of it. So yeah. Well, they, there That's you it. have it. Piotr, thanks for coming in and talking to us about your day. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the Dominicus report. Uh, always a pleasure to have you. Uh, hopefully, we'll get to talk to you at the end of Thursday's race as well. John, yeah, the sun, <laughs> there you go. After the P1, we're calling it early. We called it Thursday. We're still calling it yeah. on Saturday afternoon. John Dalton, uh, I got to say, it was a day that threw everything at the drivers. A couple of them definitely rose to the occasion. But uh, more than anything, we saw some spectacular racing and some spectacular exits alike. Yeah, it was a really uh, fantastic afternoon of racing. Like you say, there was a good mix of weather, uh, which really threw a curveball in for a, a lot of the drivers. Again, maybe not everybody playing as much with the rain as they'd have hoped uh, in the kind of run up to this race. Uh, it was a bit of a, a late decision to include uh, weather in today's race. But I'm, I think I'm very glad that we did make that decision here at RCI because it did lead for some fantastic racing, some great kind of strategy calls. And again, we saw Compregna out early on the wet tire, but again, he managed to finish P2 overall in the uh, LMP2 category. So, uh, you know, some interesting strategy calls. And again, everybody being caught out, I think at some point by either the wet, the dry, or, you know, not one driver had a completely flawless race. So uh, yeah, for my first iRacing event, I'm, I'm very glad that I decided to uh, do this alongside you, Jesse, and I'm sure I'll be back for another one very soon. 100%. Absolutely a pleasure, buddy. Thanks for coming in. The same with Ash Bibby as well. Coming in on short notice and short staff to run this event to make sure that it gets the coverage that it certainly deserves. And man, did it deliver. Sindelar, your winner in GTP over Holland and Rafier in LMP2 was Bart Macha taking the win over Kamferger and Dijkstra. And in GTD, Dozal leads it nearly flag to flag over Pillbeam and Bullwinkle, your podiums in class. Folks, thanks for joining us here for a special Saturday afternoon stream. I've been Jesse Lee, joined by John Dalton and Ash Bibby. It's been our absolute pleasure to share this afternoon with you. We'll be back a little bit later tonight for continuing coverage of Season 17 of Night Owl. See, John, that's how you say it. And until then... We'll see you next time. Have a good night.